Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the MEF Roundtable on people with disability, a hidden market of a billion you should consider. Um, we have a tremendous roster of speakers. It's going to be an exciting and important event, and it's taking place in the context of the publication um, by MEF of the report by Chris Lewis uh, last month. And Chris will be co-hosting this event together with Dario Betti. And you'll hear from them, the, the, Dario Betta, the CEO of MEF, and you'll be hearing from them in a minute. Let me just um, give a, f a few words of introduction. Um, why is MEF publishing this report on people with disability? And why is this event taking place? It's important to say that our mission statement include, ha has within it the words inclusion for all. And that has very, a very broad meaning but it means all members of our ecosystem and all consumers. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone that we are keen for our members and for the industry to reach out to the billion users worldwide with disabilities who today may often not feel fully included in mobile services. Uh, we pride ourselves on working as a cross-sector organization for networking, collaboration, um, and advanced industry solutions. And the whole topic of inclusion, the whole topic of access is a very much a cross-sector topic. It's all about how devices, services, personal data, payments mechanisms, all how they all interact. And that requires collaboration along the value chain and, that, and facilitating that collaboration is what MEF does. As our life expectancy continues to expand, we're going to see how um, living with disability becomes a more and more common feature um, across all demo across demographics, and it's essential that sustainable businesses in the future uh, look at uh, meeting those needs in order to remain relevant and assuring the states that the sustainability of the industry and of the companies within that industry has always been a, a MEF core role. But it's worth saying that here at MEF we're doing things differently. Most many attempts to address the challenges of meeting the needs of, the, of, of disabled people come at it from a corporate social responsibility angle. Uh, we look at we we look at it and we're presenting it instead as a way for advancing business. Uh, at MEF, we typically deal with chief sales officers, chief marketing officers, chief product officers, and with CEOs, and we want them to pay attention. They want to, we want them to see the needs of a million, of a billion unserved consumers as a tremendous business opportunity. If we focusing it like that, it merges the interests of, the, of those consumers with the interests of the businesses that need to collaborate in order to meet them. The timing is excellent. Mobile is now very much mature for accessibility. Mobile devices are widely available, widely affordable, um, widely owned throughout the market, and they are because they're increasingly sophisticated. Um, they contain more and more means to serve the needs of disabled people. So there is an unparalleled potential today. Mobile services today are much more able to mix media, so including voice and video and text and graphics, to provide an, a, a multimedia experience which can address the requirements of. Uh, all sorts uh, of people with all sorts of, of, of disabilities. The timing is right. We at MEF have the right ingredients. Um, we now have the vision and we wish to build the vision amongst our stakeholders and to create a sense of urgency to tackle this opportunity. In my company, I prove inclusion is a fundamental value and a fundamental business driver. And so this is a, a topic um, about which I, have, I feel very passionately. Today, for those of you with listening difficulties, um, we have live transcripts or captions uh, available at the bottom of the screen provided by our sponsor, SyncWords. Just go to the bottom of the, uh, of the Zoom screen and click the button uh, to display them in real life, to display them on your screen. And now I'd like to hand over to the CEO of MEF, Dario Betti, and to Chris Lewis uh, to take forward this wonderful event. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for the, the nice words and the great introductions. Uh, Andrew is uh, the, the chairman of, of MEF and one of the founders. And hello from me, I am Dario Vitti. I'm currently 
the chief executive officer. Um, apologies, I have some horrible sound background for you. Good news, I won't be here for too long. Um, but you will be in the hands of Chris uh, very soon. Um, Chris uh, Lewis, uh, the uh, highly regarded telecom analyst, somebody uh, with 30 years of experience in the field. I met him 20 years ago. And uh, I believe working with him, also not realizing that he was legally blind in uh, the first month or so I worked with him, that was how much good he was with uh, the different assistant technologies that he's been using ever since. Um, so who else to ask for a report that puts together the potential in mobile and the technologies available at this post? Um, Chris, welcome. Welcome again to Math. Dario, it's an absolute pleasure. And Andrew, thank you for those introductory words. And of course, one of the things we should think about throughout this event is that, you know, the accessibility, the inclusion using platforms like Zoom and Teams and WebEx and so on, actually, we, we face some challenges. So let's let's see how seamlessly people like myself and at least one other contributor as blind people can, uh, can use the platform uh, fully accessible. It is a journey for, for us as well, Chris. And by the way, I should say thanks again to Sync Words, which has been our sponsor partner and providing the human uh, live caption for today. So uh, accessibility is a journey. We're just starting on that as well. But uh, let's talk about what you've been busy with. Uh, the report, which is available uh, for people to download freely, I'm sure that soon in the chat we might have a link or some information on how to do that in case you haven't read um, but tell me a bit more the, the title was a person with disability the hidden market um, and let's start with person with disability the pwd as you call it as well uh, can you define who we're talking about who's a person with disability yeah what what is fascinating to, to begin with and initially i did some work on this uh, in 2014 with, with uh, Dr. Mike Short when he's at Telefonica. The, the definition as an analyst, you're always looking to, to define your segment and put parameters around it. What it turned out is that actually identification and statistics around different disabilities are really varied and no consistent source for, for identifying it. So in that original work, I, I did look at it, which is where the billion came from. The billion is sort of an accepted number now across, across the industry. Uh, but of course, what it's made up of is people with vision impairment like myself, hearing impaired like the people using the captioning, uh, physical impairment, uh, people in wheelchairs and so on, and of course, cognitive and learning. So, so the, the categories, they sound straightforward enough, but actually even within the vision impairment community, you know, when, when you first met me, Dario, I was legally blind, but I can tell you I'm a lot more blind now than I was when I, was, when I met you 20 years ago. So the degree of disability is also really important. And of course, the issue about aging population and people who, who, uh, who acquire an impairment as they get older, as their hearing starts to, to drop off and their sight starts to drop off and their dexterity starts to drop off, let alone any cognitive issues. So it's, it's really important to, to bear in mind that the billion includes a very wide range of, uh, of degrees of disability and, of course, all those different disabilities. Some hidden, and I think, I think uh, this point has been made uh, before, that sometimes we don't even see that people have a disability if they, for example, you know, respond very badly to sound or there's a, an anxiety type, type issue, or indeed things like um, dyslexia, you know, very, very, very uh, common problems. So I think we, we have to be very careful in, in exposing this issue and making people much more aware of it. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm delighted today we've got such a wide variety of contributors uh, to that discussion. Um, so I, I, the billion takeaway is it shows that the size of this market and then you were just mentioning how this is a grayscale, if you want, there is not a clear definition in and out. And uh, But actually, uh, probably it's true that our life is, as you were saying, a bit of a grayscale itself, we start maybe fully able, but then given our life expectancy so extending, so many of us might extend our, develop our own disabilities in yeah, later years. So it's a real issue for everybody. Absolutely, and, and I think one of the really important things, uh, and I'm sure the others on the, on the call will, will possibly comment on this later, but you know, when I was first diagnosed as being visually impaired, I didn't want to carry a white cane. I didn't want a guide dog. I thought I can, I can live without this. 
but gradually. So th there's an issue about the acceptance of the individual of the, of the need of the disability and the need for special support. And then there's the there's the acceptance of the community and society as well, the other way around. So yeah, it, it's a it's a it's a topic that touches everybody. And and in fact, economically, since we're talking about the economic impact, you know, we 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 are calculated it's something like a four trillion dollar impact because of the uh, the earning power and the spend and the spending power of people with disability. So it is a commercial issue. Uh, it's not just a CSR issue, as, as was said, in, would have been in the past. It's very much a business issue. And that's what we're trying to emphasize here. And, and that's what I, I drew out during the report. And, and yet in the report, the subtitle is the hidden segment. So we have the size, we have revenues out there, people ready to engage. Um, but why is it hidden? Well, as, as with whenever you're doing a report, as you know from your days as an analyst, you, you want, want something which actually captures part of the part of the issue. And of course, for and I'll use it as a very personal example. You know, as a as a as an eleven year old, I was sent away to a blind boarding school in the UK. You know, people with disability disability were not to be seen, almost Victorian values. You know, pushed away out in there. And I think because of people's lack of understanding of PWD, I think a lot of the disability issues are not understood in the mainstream, let alone understood as being a commercial opportunity. And, and, and what's happened is that technology and, and services used to be very specific to different disabilities, uh, very expensive, clunky equipment that was designed for people like me with vision impairment or, or, or hearing aids, you know, or of course, uh, wheelchairs and the like. But actually now, uh, to Andrew's opening comments point, the mobile phone becomes that common denominator, a scale denominator, and an, an affordable denominator, and a platform upon which we can build accessible solutions. So it has been hidden, but we're increasingly looking at it being exposed as, as that business opportunity. Oh, and so you're just touching now on technology and the smartness of a smartphone. And so let me touch, I mean, ask a bit more. Are they even smart enough to deal with the omni-channel multimedia environment? Is it something, are we, are we ready, really, to do it? Do you know, that there, there's a very interesting, in, in discussing this with many other, especially visually impaired people, uh, I get accused of being the glass is half full because I'm positive about it. There are certainly those who believe it's half empty because they still feel frustrated that so much more could be done. But the fact is that the, the technical building blocks, you know, the hooks into the operating system, uh, the standards and the frameworks within the applications development environment, those are there. And certainly you know, in, in standard approach to, to building websites and so on. So I believe the, the many of those issues are there, the blocks are there, but actually pulling them together as an industry and also educating the people around, around the, the, the users at the end of the service. You know, I, I'm, I'm lucky to have been a technology analyst all my life and got access to great technology very quickly. Uh, I have a younger brother who's blind who hates technology and, you know, really struggles with it. So there, there you have the bookends, you know, of someone who's lucky to be an advanced user of the technology and at the other end, someone that really struggles even to answer a phone call on a, on a smart device. It feels like we're going to have a debate later on coming on the readiness of the glass, how full or how healthy, empty, empty. Um, but let me ask for well, the final question before I let you then take over the uh, the, the, the chat with our uh, colleagues uh, coming soon. Inclusion and design inclusion. We've heard about uh, the principle of design thinking, but are we ready to be the recipe that the CEOs out there, the one that... Uh, our chairman, Andrew Bagwood, was referring to the CEO, the CMOs that want to uh, engage a bit more in this segment. What should they be doing? What should they be asking? It, it's, it's so fundamental. And, and I think the example I would give you is when I first started working for a, a soft, the logic of the software house back in the, blimey, long, long time ago, that my first piece of kit was a thing that plugged into my computer and scrolled big big orange text letters across the screen. If the things you might have seen at a, at a football stadium, for example, a really clunky bit of add-on kit, and that, and that's what happens is you you add things on, you do it afterwards. It's clunky. It doesn't get the benefit of all of the technology. By starting with inclusion, designing from scratch, then we start to get all the benefits of the technology as as it appears. 
and, and, if, and as you'll hear from various contributions during the rest of the session, that that means also not, not just doing it once, but keeping that at the heart of the design process, because it, it not only it applies to people with disabilities, but because, as you said, we're talking about omnichannel and all those different means of interacting with your customers uh, or, or with your service provider or technology provider, that at some, on some occasions, you know, if you're driving a car, you, then you're not going to use the, vi the vision input. You might turn to text and audio, audio described text in there. So what we begin to get is a much richer service and experience that, uh, that gives everybody the opportunity you know, to benefit from this. And if we do it from scratch, then we don't need to do clunky add-ons. It's built into the process. It becomes second nature. And of course, my dream is that we get to a stage where this stuff is built so much into the DNA of everything that we all do in our, at a business level that we, we stop even talking about accessibility because we've, uh, we've achieved it. But we're a long way from that. And I think there's, there's, there's many questions to be, to be covered in the meantime. Well, I'll leave you to ask some of that questions to the people out there. I'll just remind that in the chat, uh, in Zoom, you will find the link that magically appears in case you want to download and, and listen more uh, from the research. And that will also be followed in uh, an email later on. We have additional information on how to find much more at the end of uh, this session. So Chris, I'll disappear now and the floor is all yours. Thank you, Dario. And also, yes, if, if people have questions, please pop them into the... Uh, into, into the Q&A, uh, and, and this is partly an accessibility issue, uh, but Dario and Susan from the, from the MEF uh, are going to keep an eye on those questions and then uh, bring them and introduce them as we go, as we go through. So we've broken this, this session into two main chunks. So the, the first chunk is really around stakeholders uh, and, and, the, and the people involved in the whole area of, of, of accessibility and people with disability. So we'll touch upon that. I'll introduce all of those in a second. And then the second chunk is around really looking towards the future and the industry uh, and, and where, where it all goes. Uh, there, of course, may well be some cross-fertilization between the people involved in both of those segments. And what I've said to everybody uh, is rather than raising their hand, if they, were, they should literally speak up. So I will try and remember to pause and give chance if anybody uh, wants to duck in. Now, uh, given, given the times that we're in and given the availability of some of the people who wanted to be involved in this session, we couldn't get everybody live today. We've been lucky to get such a fantastic lineup, uh, but we do have some contributions by video. So to kick off the stakeholder session, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Mike Short from the Department of International Trade in the UK, who's the Chief Science Officer. And Mike, as I mentioned before, was the person who actually got me involved in writing about this and doing the initial analysis back in 2014, which led to that being presented at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona and some other work we'll see from the Valuable 500 later on, which kicked off from that. So Sam, could you play the mic short video, please? So Mike, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, having initiated the, the research that I carried out in 2014, 2015, can you perhaps share with us your thoughts on, on the report and the progress we've made and perhaps any areas that we missed? The innovation has clearly moved on. Uh, we can now see uh, not just devices, but also um, apps and wearables. But I think uh, what we don't see is the uptake in demand which is really quite strange. Uh, perhaps it's the sales channels not being aware of the range of innovations that have occurred and the solutions available. But I would also add there are two other markets that are adjacent, which make the market even bigger. So if we think about the market for the elderly, where some of the solutions are as important for the elderly as they are for people with disability. And also if we think about the health market, Clearly, that's showing more interest now than it ever was. And some of those health market areas to do with chronic health conditions or maybe uh, apps to solve some of the health areas are really showing an uptick, uh, perhaps because of this pandemic. It's fascinating, isn't it, that the, the, the area which was so, so focused on a particular factor of the mobile device and the sort of the fact we're focusing on accessibility, but the more inclusive design starts to bring us where, yeah, it expands the market. It becomes part of every market rather than a specific market for a particular, particular disability. Well, the mobile phone is the most inclusive electronic 
product on the planet and together with the internet there are many more solutions clearly issues of security and privacy need to be taken into account but but actually these solutions are available to everybody uh, but they need to be understood and explained which is why i think the sales channels might need to do a bit of a, a lift in this area yes and in fact it brings the issue that we've mentioned in the report about the the channel in terms of the third sector the charitable players and, and their relationships with the, the people with disability, but also the technology players, because the mobile companies do touch such an enormous proportion of people on the planet. But also we need to get even more affordable devices into those people's hands and educate them how to use them and how to use those apps. I think the affordability is coming along because of the economies of scale. You know, we have far more economies of scale in the mobile phone and the internet industry than other industries. Um, but the awareness still is lacking and uh, more work could be done to raise awareness. I think businesses and initiatives like the Value 500 are helpful to actually raise uh, the business awareness in this area. But I think more needs to be done, particularly with the user in mind. Yes, and we know the range of users, the range of disabilities, the range of abilities, should we say, in terms of being able to use devices, especially, as you said, in the in the in the elderly market and people who perhaps don't who aren't familiar with devices but hopefully that education side comes through as, as children come through school using devices whether ipads or or smartphones and so on so i, I agree with you i think the the, the landscape is looking promising uh, but from your point of view uh, working as a, a chief scientist in a government department where do you see the innovation coming from I think the innovation comes from everywhere. I, I don't think there's a lack of innovation. Uh, I think government have some role uh, in this area, but I don't think they should necessarily lead the innovation. Uh, some of the uh, notable improvements uh, in things like text to speech or speech to text have come through research, which may have been funded by government. But, but I also think that some of the areas about awareness, government does have a role, particularly in education, as, as you said earlier. And I also think areas like type approval, it's quite difficult to do type approved uh, devices from a, a complete disability perspective, but, but it, encouraging uh, the inclusive design, I think is a natural role for government. And already we see attention to that with some of the disability legislation that exists. Yes, legislation, of course, of course, plays a role. But and I think the really interesting area, the, the focus on artificial intelligence, where, of course, everything becomes software driven on top of that basic hardware platform of the device and the ability to leverage all of that compute power, whether it's on the device, in the cloud, really starts to wrap a service around the way in which it needs to be enhanced for different individuals, whether they are, as you say, people with disability, people in the elderly space, or indeed there's people in the healthcare and social care sector where you know, it is important to wrap the right service around them. Well, I think social care is important because actually when I think about the health and wellness market, clearly we're touching everybody's home, everybody's lives. Uh, so we need to make sure that for society, it's an inclusive set of solutions altogether. And that's why I don't think it's government alone that should be, be promoting this. I think... Uh, it, it requires all the channels to really harness the, the, the innovation that's come along. And there will be more innovation, of course, which makes it complex, but, but addressing it now with solutions today means getting on the bandwagon. Indeed, and I think that, that common denominator of the mobile device, and indeed we talk in the report about smart speakers in the home for people like myself who, who can't see, all of these things start to give us access to the, that digital landscape that allow us to live a, live a more complete life and, and not be put into the, the pigeonhole of being blind or hearing impaired or, or disabled in other ways. So, Mike, as ever, always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for your input. Thank you for your continued support on the disability uh, push and the inclusivity push. And uh, we look forward to having you with us at an event in the future. Thank you. I, th I think you'll agree, you know, Mike brings a perspective there for many years, having worked in there and, and seeing the innovation side growing through. So in terms of our now live panelist contributions, and I, I like to think of 
think of you all as being my expert witnesses in this as, as we gradually assemble information and thoughts and uh, on the topic. Um, so in terms of, I'm, I'm going to introduce the, the, the next four people. So we're going to have Francis West, followed by Robin Christofferson, followed by Neil Milligan, and then Hector Minto. So Francis West, uh, I'd like to start with you, Francis, and with your background, having been the, the head of accessibility at IBM and now doing work in the UN and having written a book on the subject, can you share with us your perspective on this topic? Well, first, thank you for the invitation, Chris. Um, yeah, so this topic, as you know, um, it's a topic that is very dear to my heart and since my work at IBM. And as I was listening to the opening remarks by Andrew, by Dario, and also um, by various people, I think everybody already mentioned that this is a topic about all of us, right? We talked about, you know, any one of us can join the uh, disability through accidents, sickness, or or um, or in this case, natural aging. Another area is really what I call the situational uh, disability. I remember when I uh, first went to the United States as an immigrant from uh, Hong Kong, uh, I was functionally blind and deaf, you know, and I can read better than I can hear. And with technology like speech to text, when if somebody was speaking to me, especially the first place I landed was in Lexington, Virginia, with an accent, and if you can have capture the speech into text, you know, for me as a foreign student at the time, can understand much better. So to, to a great extent, the technology we're talking about here is what I call the extreme personalization. And that uh, technology enable us now to be able to functionally um, play or learn or work or socialize. Uh, you know, at kind of a, at scale, right? So, so this whole topic of uh, accessibility or digital inclusion, to me, is just a natural evolution, actually, of the society in general, and underpinned, of course, by the technology advancement. Um, if you, when I, again, if I look back at my career uh, in the 80s, we were talking about mainframe computers. At that time, technology very much reserved or uh, special people who are computer scientists. But now we have the complete uh, consumerization. And uh, so from that standpoint, every person um, should have access to technology. And it's so tech for good is not, should not be an aspirational goal, but should be a foundational goal for everybody because technology is the necessity for all of us. And specifically in the mobile world, uh, I remember, um, you know, e every time when we have a change of um, infrastructure technology, let's say from personal computer to internet, and then from internet to mobile, it really opens up the uh, the citizens or every every person's usage of the technology. And I, I remember our conversation uh, uh, in Barcelona in 2015, that was at the beginning or or the shaping of the uh, mobile uh, mobile first evolution or revolution uh, I, I think if you look back six years from now with with cloud, cloud computing especially with 5g technology now uh, there are just so much possibility that technology can have and impact our lives but at the same time our collective responsibility is much higher now and so from that standpoint, that's why I think it's very important that we individually or as companies, especially tech companies, working closely with the government in making sure that there's a public-private partnership, not just on the innovation or technology, but on the policy side. And, and on that note, that's why I, you know, I start working uh, you know, with the United Nations and so on, because to me, some of the uh, goals, for example, set by uh, UN like sustainable development goal uh, for 2030 translate very well into the business goal and, or business objective, which is where I'm you know my whole orientation has been from. And that um, we all heard about people talking about ESG now, right? Uh, environment, um, sustainability and governance. And every company investors uh, annual report now talk about ESG. And to me, digital inclusion is absolutely important to be the a part of that discussion 
and that's going to take all of us kind of working together. Thank you very much, Francis. Yes, you raised that, that great issue of the acronyms, don't you, from, from corporate social responsibility to ESG and to sustainability. And, uh, and you're right, I, I would love to come up with a slide which actually shows how all of those things fit together in sort of financial responsibility, you know, ethical responsibility and so on. But we will we'll come back to we'll come back to that and have, and have some discussion once we've run through this series of players. Uh, Robin Christofferson, the legend that is AbilityNet, I believe you've in fact just been judging the AbilityNet Awards and perhaps we can touch upon those later. But as a, as a fellow blind person working very much, uh, can we say at the coal face? I'm not sure it's a relevant Definitely. phrase to use, but working at the coal face with people with with disability we'd love to hear your your perspective on the topic brilliant thank you very much and yeah ability net we're um uk technology and disability experts and i've been lucky enough to be working with them for 25 years with the same organization it's like being paid to play it's fantastic and we definitely are a coal face organization because we work with disabled individuals all the time in our service delivery as well as doing accessibility consultancy and that sort of thing but um, yeah, I've also been a judge for five years running now at the GLOMOs, the Global Mobile Awards at MWC. So I'm really, really happy that that's represented today as well. Um, so I'm really going to build on what everyone's spoken about up till now and, and, and definitely kind of following on from what Francis was saying, which is that mobile, you know, we're definitely living in a mobile first world. I don't need to, you know, that's not gonna be news to anyone on the call today. Um, on average, I think the last number I saw was 56% of traffic to any given website is from mobile. And that obviously doesn't include apps, which are obviously, you know, um, in <laughs> mobile only and wouldn't be included in that data, but would significantly up the number. So, yeah, websites are getting hit from mobile devices by default these days. Now, Francis talked about situational um, disability or impairment. At AbilityNet, because we do work with people with disabilities all the time, and we deliver um, assessments to students and people in the workplace, and we assess people at home, we see impairments right across the spectrum. And someone in work who is getting eye strain on a Friday afternoon or wrist pain absolutely should contact their line manager, for example, and would come through to AbilityNet or other organizations that deliver those services because there are solutions for them. And as we touched upon earlier, accessibility is built into our devices these days, no more so than in mobile phone devices or mobile devices. If, for example, you did a spider diagram of the accessibility settings, no, of the whole, access, of the whole settings app on iOS, so uh, showed everything that was built into the settings app in iOS, the accessibility settings would be over 60% of that. So over half of the things that you can customize on your phone, on iOS, for example, and I'm sure this the same in Android, um, is around helping you to get a customized experience. We absolutely, none of us should be settling for a vanilla out of the box experience. We're all different shapes and sizes. And we've heard a lot about acquired impairment and situational impairment where it's a noisy environment, for example, but I would actually say, you know, go even further than that and say that every single one of us, regardless of whether we think we've got any kind of impairment at all, are sliding up and down the scale of impairment on a minute by minute or hour by hour basis. Because anyone that's using a mobile as their device is what I would call extreme computing. You're computing on the edge. You know, if you're using your phone one handed with just your thumb to tap on items, controls, or to use the on-screen keyboard, you have exactly the same requirements as someone with a motor or dexterity impairment. You know, the guidelines that have accessibility in the title, WCAG for web, for example, there are similar standards for Android and iOS, um, are aimed at people with disabilities, yes, but if you consider, you know, minimal tap, minimum tappable areas, 44 by 44 PX, by the way, if you're interested, and good separation between tappable elements, then you're going to be helping people with a motor difficulty 24 seven, but you're absolutely going to be helping people who are using their phone one handed for whatever reason, which is probably most of us today. Ditto, uh, you know, bumpy bus, 
bumpy car drive, you're going to be um, dexterity impaired in trying to use your device, hopefully as a passenger in a car. Uh, noisy cafe, we've touched upon noise, but you know, everybody who is using the devices in a noisy environment may want to take advantage of things like closed captions, you know, the subtitles on YouTube videos where they're available, or if they're auto generated by Google, say. Um, I asked my daughter before we came on if she'd ever turned on captions on YouTube, and she said, yes, it just makes it easier for, to hear what people are saying if you can read it as well. Those were her words, and she's not got an impairment of any kind. Google have um, told us that 60% of people who are using the YouTube app on their phone have captions turned on. So again, you know, over half of people, and certainly they don't all have dyslexia or uh, you know literacy difficulty, for example. It's about situational uh, accessibility requirements, as Francis was saying. I could go on and on, small sheet of shiny glass on a sunny day. People who are accessing uh, a website or an app need exactly the same requirements for a good color contrast choice, good default font size and style choices on those apps and websites that people who have got a bigger screen in a much more controlled environment um, on their desk, for example, would need as well. So I could go on and on and on. Um, I've just been on a, a presentation earlier with um, Hector and he mentioned something brilliant, which is that there's really no such thing as assistive technology these days either. So whilst digital inclusion is no longer just for disabled people, similarly, just like the proliferation of settings of controls that you can do within your devices has really blossomed in recent years and matured. Similarly, you know, speech talking to your computer, as Chris mentioned, um, you know, is that just disabled people controlling their or dictating to their computers these days? Absolutely not. Everyone's talking to the devices all the time. Speech output, is that just for Chris or myself? Absolutely not. You know, if you're using a smart speaker or if you're using a virtual assistant, chances are it will be speaking stuff back to you. We all love the way of stripping out ads and clutter on web pages. And there's that play button to read that article back to you. If that will speak well, with that kind of technology, then chances are it's going to be really uh, accessible to us as screen reader users, for example. Um, even hardware, this is my favourite piece of assistive technology. For people that can't see, I'm wearing a snazzy pair of sunglasses here. These aren't for people with disabilities. These are the Bose frames, but they basically got you know, they're a Bluetooth headset for taking calls and listening to audio. I can listen to my screen reader on my phone. When I'm out and about, because they don't cover my ears, they fire the sound into it, into them, then I've still got my ears uh, open for crossing roads, etc. so I don't get squished by traffic. So these are a, a massive boon. I can use Soundscape, the brilliant Microsoft app, thank you Hector, um, that tells me exactly what I'm passing and when to turn, etc. So yeah, this is my favorite piece of, of kit and it's got nothing to do with people with disabilities. But for me, as a disabled person, it makes all the difference. We're gonna hear from Christopher of Google later on. And um, if, if I had a pair of Google Glass, then I'm sure they, they would become my favorite bit of kit because they've also got additional sensors, like a, a camera built into them that as a blind person, I would use to death as well to get information about what's around me. So this is a very complicated, nuanced area, but the main takeaway that we should all bear in mind is that we're absolutely not just talking about a ghetto niche consideration here. We're talking about making essential digital services, life-changing, life-affirming uh, digital services uh, that have never been more important that they are, than they are now available to everyone. If you make them accessible to people with extreme needs, they're going to be extremely usable to people that haven't got quite such um, specific needs themselves. But we're all sliding up and down that spectrum of impairment every single minute that we're using a mobile device. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Robin. The um... In fact, in fact, are you taking commission on those? Because I, 
Are you, are you taking commission on those glasses, of Robin? Because I did now buy a pair, so you should be in touch with Bose for a, a, a free. Those frames, free, they're a bit pricey, Bose. but... They yeah, are a bit, they, like you say, they, they're, they're great. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think one thing that, that Robin touched upon there, something that Mike mentioned, you know, the this extends, and I guess the the lockdown has made us many things more, more evident to us, uh, certainly the, the healthcare and social care, the reach into people's lives right down to a very, very micro level uh, through it, through it, this sort of technology is absolutely uh, something we will build upon going forward. So thank you, Robin. So we, we continue to build and I'm delighted now to, went to, to welcome Neil Milliken from Atos. Neil, you, you come at this, you host a very successful uh, Twitter discussion on disability. I'm sure you'll, you'll mention that during your, during your, 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 your presentation here. Um, the floor is yours, Neil. Excellent. So thank you very much. Um, I fully agree with Robin that, uh, that our state of disablement um, changes regularly throughout the day. I would, as an ADHD, it's not so much sliding up and down the scale as running up and down the slide and bouncing around. So, um, so I, I think that also having been using assistive technologies for a long time, actually technology in itself is or good technology should be assistive. So I think that 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 the that whilst there is use in, in still building specific assistive technologies, the we, we ought not to to silo them because actually some of the mainstream technologies for me uh, as someone with a cognitive disability and with organizational problems that and, and time management problems, things like Microsoft Outlook were revelationary to me because they enabled me to to sort of get control of my life and um in a way that i couldn't do before so um so technology is an enabler when we when we design and, and often as as has been said obviously designing for the edge cases makes it easier for for the center um but i've loved mobile since um since i first got them because it meant that instead of some some of these amazing technologies being tied to the desk they come with me and you know if, if you need assistive technology you need it with you wherever you are uh, and so you don't need these really big clunky things you need it built into the one thing that you've got with you which is your your, your mobile device essentially now those types of devices may change they you know they may turn out to be smart glasses or other smart things like watches and, and so on and so forth but but the the concept of mobility and portability of tech and for that assistance to be ubiquitous is is hugely enabling so so that's something i'm, I'm a, a, you know a user of um but also a, a keen advocate of, of making sure that we build this into all of the platforms and that we make sure it's it's available to all uh, all people and everywhere um, and, and that means also thinking about how we might deliver that equivalence, because actually mobile is particularly important in uh, the global south, where um, people are reliant on phones, they're not necessarily quite as smart or quite as new and signals are not quite as good and data costs are higher. So how we deliver them on device as much of the as much of uh, that experience on device rather than through uh, expensive uh data connections is important um i also um work in what is now our group csr um and and i'm involved with all of the esg environment social and governance aspects of our organization um and, and actually i agree with with francis that there is this uh really strong focus of organizations to to start embedding inclusion into this so so what we're actually doing within our own organization within atos and we're we're quite large we've got about 110,000 people and and we do a lot around decarbonization and sustainability is starting to build the the concept of inaccessibility uh and accessibility and that sort of disability inclusion governance into the same framework uh so we're looking at making sure that we we treat accessibility in the same way that we do for sort of sustainability so we have scope one two and three so it's the stuff that's sort of inside our own control uh then what we can 
buy and 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 in our supply chain and then up and down the value chain would be the, the third scope so so looking at these kind of things means that we can as an organization also influence other organizations to be more inclusive and, and plan and i think that this is this is an ongoing trend and that we're going to see more and more of this as organizations recognize that this is something that um you know the business ecosystem wishes for you know um we're all members of uh, a lot of us are members of Babel 500 uh certainly at us i um i know a lot of other large organizations have joined up so there is this groundswell of ceo opinion that wishes us to be accessible wishes us to be inclusive wants to work together so um, having this framework to be able to deliver accessibility is really important. Um, and then on top of that, there's legislation coming. So um, because we haven't always um, designed to the best of our intentions or we've, or we've ignored people, we know as people in the field that accessibility is important, that it's good design, that it enables everyone, but quite often, there has been this argument about why should I do it? Maybe it makes my product look less nice. Accessibility is hard. Um, getting away from them um, has been a challenge. I think that we're part way there. But so we've got lots of carrots. We've got the, the demand from business and all of these positive things. At the same time, the, the, there's a reason why the laws are there, and that's because not always does positivity work. So we've got this big shift from um in terms of legislation happening and i think that one of the challenges that industry has is as this legislation comes into place how do we actually measure all of this stuff real world so we've got standards but but what does it mean for real world users because the the we've talked about the diversity of disability you know we have a diverse user base we have cultural diversity as well so so really is you know how do we think about what it means to be accessible yes there's compliance yes there's standards but what is it about you know what do we actually want to achieve and and so uh we have a mutual friend chris his name's kevin k carey he he talked about um peer normative equivalence of experience and um and i think that there's something in that but how we actually sort of measure this and, and sort of have this sort of really good understanding of what it means to be included at scale is a challenge for us um, and is a challenge for the mobile industry as well, but it's mobile industry has the biggest scale of all of the industries. And so I think that that's something that, that maybe I'd just like to seed in people's heads uh, as, as something that maybe we should be considering as to how do we understand what it is? What, what does good look like? And how do we measure that? And how do we sort of feed that back through our total value chain? Thank you, Neil. As ever, very insightful. And, and we'll get you to do a plug for your, uh, your Twitter discussion uh, later on. Uh, now to Hector and the, and the role of the, the technology providers. We, we've had a lot of comments about the state of technology. Mike, in the opening comments, talked about how advanced we we've become from the days of 2014 when he and I first looked at this subject. So Hector, from a, a Microsoft point of view, please uh, share your perspective. Hey, Chris, uh, thanks for letting me join today. Uh, maybe I should plug Neil's amazing hashtag AXS chat, access chat. Uh, I tune in every week. Um, so it's, it's so difficult following three such amazing speakers, experts in this field, you know, what's left for me to talk about. I think I'd start with genuinely the relationship between humans and technology is changing. I think that's the fundamental you know, shift that we've seen over the last 15 to 20 years. We used to go to work to use technology. We used to go to education establishments to use technology. Now we wake up with technology under our pillows, right? So, so it's like we, we, we constantly, you know, we, we depend on it. And that changing relationship with technology is changing the expectation of people with disabilities for things to be accessible. You know, if things are not accessible nowadays, then you miss out. You're excluded from critical services, health, education, finance. You know, it's no longer, the, the mobile phone is the delivery engine for all of these critical life services. And so we just can't ignore accessibility moving forward, but the challenge is how do we, 
how do we build momentum and expectation amongst the people who author technology, create the, that digital infrastructure that's all around us to, to hear the voices of people with disabilities. And, and you'll hear from me, you'll hear from Chris later on, you know, clearly big tech needs to be in the game here. You know, we need to be influencing not just the, the technology that we build, you know, the, the operating systems that we deploy, but also the partner networks that we depend on. You know, Microsoft makes an awful lot of its revenue from partner networks. And when we deliver product to them that they're then going to build on the back of and deploy, uh, we need to put disability inclusion at the very top of that partner messaging. We need to change the expectation of the people building technology out there that accessibility is an expectation of ours as much as it's an expectation of society. And the good news is we're winning. You know, we're starting to win. We're starting to see and maybe a little bit even more glass half full than you, Chris. Uh, you know, I, I genuinely think that when people are educated, they will, they, you know, they do create. They do, you know, once they've made a commitment, they do deliver on it. Um, but we've got a lot of education to do. And, and one of the other motivators here, I do think is, you know, you'll hear from the Valuable 500 data, is, is leaders, political leaders, as much as business leaders. Uh, industry voices, thought leaders need to be aware of the needs of people with disabilities and to put it out there as a, a social value. I mean, the, the inclusive design benefits that everyone's talked about, Robin mentioned it perfectly, you know, one handed typing, like how could we, you know, how could we go back to the world of the flip out keyboard and the two thumbs on a, on a mobile phone? You know, we're not we're not going there. One handed haptic touch on mobile is critical now for us to have a great experience. Um, so, so how do we get the, the, the design principles of accessibility and inclusion to be more mainstream it is, is fr frantically, fr uh, frankly our biggest challenge. Um, so my job at Microsoft is to, is to scale this support for accessibility, both internally and externally talking to every industry, talking to every country, talking to through our partner network. And generally, we share our strategy, and I'll, and I'll just give you a quick in, bit of insight into that. And um, we start with culture. You know, we have a very strong disability voice within Microsoft uh, that gets louder all the time, uh, led by a chief accessibility officer who is herself a person with a disability, saying, we will do this, and who has the full backing of the CEO. What that then leads us to do is look at how many people with disabilities have we got within the fabric of our organization. And so that makes us reflect on our processes, our biz apps, our HR portals, our, our learning and work, all has to be routinely accessible. That greater representation of disability inside a business like Microsoft starts to lead to reflecting on the gaps in our product. So much easier when somebody in your team says it doesn't work than a feedback on a forum that says it doesn't work. You get buy-in. And then the last pillar is innovation. And that's where it gets super exciting. We've mentioned AI and seeing AI already. When you look at seeing AI, uh, which is a, an amazing app for the blind community built by a blind engineer at Microsoft, solving his own challenges uh, on, a, on a mobile. The thing I always point to on it is the reading, the text read loud feature. Now, Sakib knew that he had to do that offline. He knew that he could send data up to the cloud and have it processed. But when he's trying to read minutes in a meeting or a document in the bank in the moment, he just knew he couldn't rely on data to do that. Uh, and so he made it work on the edge. So that optical character recognition to speech on the edge with zero connectivity required was a, de a deliberate design decision that somebody else wouldn't have made. Somebody would have put the functionality in, but not made that specific need, yeah, user need in there. And I think that's really where we then roll right back to the start. We, we story tell around the, the innovation we're, we're getting, the amazing features we're starting to see, and that drives more culture, more representation, more processes, better products, more innovation. So, so that, that's really the loop that we're, that we're building up within Microsoft. We're starting to get a bit more external on this now and starting to talk with some of the world's largest industries about the clouds that they're building uh, being more inclusive and being more representative of people with disabilities. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about where we are. I don't think in my 25 years of working with assistive technology, we, were, you know, we, were, we weren't in this space. We were in niche, you know, really looking at high cost, high cost of sale. We have opportunities to do globe, to get global impact going, uh, but it starts with organizational resilience and uh, 
and buy into the topic, which you're going to hear a lot about later on. Thank you very much, Hector. Yes, in fact, I think uh, Robin referred to soundscape and you referred to seeing an eye, AI. In fact, I think in the report, I touched upon the fact that as a student in Manchester in the 80s, I used a Kurzweil reading machine, which I think cost $100,000, which was yeah. sitting in the University of Manchester Library, which was a rubbish OCR device. But that now sits on my phone as a £7.99 app. So, boy, I was clipping, I was clipping $5,000 touchscreens onto school computer screens back at the same yeah. time. And now I live in rural Oxfordshire and I can get a 60 quid replacement for my phone on the high street. <laughs> You know. <laughs> and, 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 and there was something else you, you mentioned there, which, and we're now coming on to the to the Q and A. So uh, I'm, I'm going to ask Susan to come in in one second. But be before we you, you come in, Susan, the the issue of accessing the screen, I think, is really interesting. Uh, I know Robin's a guide dog user, so am I. When I'm out walking with my guide dog, left hand is occupied. Occasionally, right hand is occupied. My phone stays in my pocket. I use a Bluetooth earpiece, and I have a mini keyboard that I use actually I even have it with me here I can even show it to people so this is the way I so I can handle that one-handed and I type I receive I message I navigate through so actually we don't always need to be touching the screen so mm -hmm. I think that's an, another uh, a, another element to it so we're beginning as I think I mentioned in the report many times that the, the technology available often mainstream tech as you pointed out the wearable stuff is available and as long as that is built from scratch with accessibility in mind, then we can add those on. So whether it's a, a camera, ultimately a camera we'd like to, to include, as we've talked about before, you know, obviously earpieces, haptic feedback on bracelets, uh, sense, sense bands that tell us what's around, all these things are, are definitely built in. So, so thank you, everybody. As, as, as Hector said, that's quite, that's quite a series of people to follow. And thank you, Hector, for, for even adding on to that. The, the, the topic in this opening slot was around stakeholders. And I sort of want to get an, an idea from people. We getting the, the, I think we've agreed. And I think Mike started this in, in the opening comments. The technology has improved dramatically. And the mobile phone at the heart of that, probably the mobile phone now combined with cloud and all the other things. And I want to add in human in, in a second as well. But, the, but that, that, that technology shifted dramatically. What hasn't changed to the, anywhere near the same extent is, is the awareness and the education of the people who would benefit from it. And I just wonder, you know, uh, uh, Robin, perhaps uh, Robin and Neil could comment first of all. Uh, do you think that is true or are, are, we, are, are we still too skeptical? Ha has it changed significantly that those stakeholders, the people who ultimately really benefit from getting, getting access to this technology? Robin, I mean, that's first. what AbilityNet is all about, trying to get that message out there. But there's no doubt at all that brilliant steps by the likes of Microsoft being very vocal about accessibility, having special events, putting out copious press releases, et cetera, doing something amazing like bringing the accessibility checker in office into a really prominent position um, is hugely beneficial. Apple bringing accessibility out from underneath general in the iOS settings app um, is, is really, really important as well. And uh, I think the only challenge now is trying to make people realize that accessibility doesn't equal disability when it comes to, you know, can I have a play with these? So that's the message to get out now. I feel like people are aware that their devices are really customizable. Um, making people have the, um, the courage and the, you know, the, the time to get familiar with those and make those changes, I think, is, is really important. A plug for a really good resource, mycomputermyway.com. We've brought the accessibility settings of all the popular platforms, iOS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and popular apps as well into one place. And you certainly won't have just images without labels where it says click here, click here. All the keystrokes are included as well, mycomputermyway.com. Brilliant. Thank you. Dario, add that to the list at the end, please. <laughs> um, and Neil, you know, I think we're, talk we're mainly here talking about in the, in the business environment, the awareness, obviously, of those stakeholders who might have a disability of some sort, but also the awareness of the people within the organisation. That they, they, As I said, I went away to a blind school as a kid. Pe people didn't see me. And I think it's raising everyone's awareness, isn't it, if it that this stuff exists? Do, do yeah. you think we've improved? 
we have improved. We've still got a long way to go. Um, but I'm like Robin and Hector. I'm a glass more than half full kind of person. We're all optimists on this panel here. Um, I, I genuinely think we're heading in the right direction. Um, whilst the Developable 500 did a report which said about the low levels of disclosure amongst CEOs, the fact that CEOs are engaged on the topic in itself is encouraging. And, and what we're finding um, is that more and more people are willing to have the conversations. I think particularly conversations around mental health and, and certain conditions, it does really vary from condition to condition how much people are willing to talk about things. But you are starting to see leaders. And within our own organization, we, we have... Um, that kind of recognition, like like within Microsoft, you know, the, the leadership role that I play now is a, is a top level management role. I sit within the you know within the hierarchy, and we report on the, on all of this stuff to the board, and it goes through, uh, you know, the the rigor of the processes of a program. So it's not like you're siloed. Um, at, at the same time, what we want is role model leaders, and and um, some of the stuff that is driven by our employee resource groups and networks also requires sponsors. And what we're, what we're finding now, and what I'm really grateful for, is the fact that the exec sponsors are finally self-identifying as having a disability. Okay. And that is really a significant shift. Uh, yes, finding that, that, that our leaders who are mostly reticent, uh, particularly leadership culture has been much more sort of uh, you know, macho BS, if I'm being frank, you know, everyone must be infallible, unbreakable leader, you're going to have to work really, really hard because you're, you know, CEO material. Well, now, actually, people are, I think COVID really changed things, actually, people are, are, are okay to talk about their humanity and their frailties. And, and so we're getting people now starting to talk about it. and I think that that's a real sea change. And that's going to, to really be something that drives the inclusion agenda forwards. And, and Francis, I, I don't know whether you can comment on this, but so we, we've talked mainly about the business environment. In, in the work you've done since leaving IBM, what, what about sort of the, the sort of the third sector, the charitable sector, and getting information through those organizations and down to individuals on that, that individual consumer basis? I think this is... Um... Uh, I think earlier, uh, I think Hector is the one that mentioned this is about human first, right? I think for all of us who are in the accessibility field, one of the foundational differences uh, working on any other technology is that you don't have to think about human. You just think about speed and feeds and efficiency, effectiveness. But this is an area that really touches human, and so therefore, the connection with the uh, nonprofit organizations uh, who really has historically been the one that really take care of what, what I call the base of the pyramid population, right? It's absolutely crucial. And, and frankly, uh, when I, uh, when I uh, uh, first became the Chief Justice Officer, I remember that uh, working, for example, in that uh, American Foundation of the Blind with nobility, these are like a... Uh, top-notch you know, nonprofit organizations in the US and also working with some of the uh, global organizations like in the UK. And they taught us so much of to stay grounded and not get carried away um, with innovation for innovation's sake or technology for technology's sake. Uh, and so I think this is, again, going back to at the kind of a meta level we, we actually owe it to, um, to the society. If we say that we're doing you know, digital inclusion for all, then we have to be really mindful in every step of the process, you know, from concept to um, design, to development, to deployment, to testing and everything that we have people with disability as part of that uh, entire ecosystem. So uh, thank you for that question, because a lot of times I, I, I do, do see that, especially in the startup world or in new innovation world, that we will, you know, kind of step ahead, you know, ourselves in terms of a focus on the technology, like right now, the greatest technology, the, the coolest technology like XR, you know, mixed reality, virtual reality. It's great, but let's make sure that we have people with disability as part of that. 
yeah, we're, we're, we're going to come into that in, in a later section. But Hector, if I might come back to you, um, obviously Microsoft does a lot of stuff. You, you're in, you're in many different markets. What about what about the, the sort of the gaming area? You know, is is this sort of, can we learn from gaming? Can we take things from that? You know, disabled people like gaming as well, don't they? Yeah, it's been amazing to watch that industry change over the last few years. Or not 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 change, but just embrace uh, disability and accessibility. I mean, gaming's meant to be difficult, right? <laughs> the whole point of it is it's like you know you know it's not a functional experience it's a challenge i thought it was uh, supposed to be enjoyable you know? yeah, well it is but you know if it was easy you'd if you completed it on day one you know it's kind of uh tricky right so but gaming has had a real journey with disability and accessibility that's been fascinating to watch um but we, we created a product called the xbox adaptive controller a few years ago so that people could essentially customize their controls this was being hacked previously people were hacking their own rigs with you know their own controllers with soldering irons right uh, and buttons and sit puff switches and the like um so we took a stand and we said no well, well we'll create the hub you know we'll create the controller we'll make it the same price as every other controller and you plug your switches in and, and, and get going and what's been interesting uh, you know microsoft's investment in that space was brilliant it was, it was amazing to watch it and i and it's actually about the same time that i joined um it's actually why i joined because you could just see that the, it was just cultural it wasn't just a you know it wasn't just it wasn't PR, you know, they were doing something, it was real. Uh, and, but what's been fascinating, and I, and I think this is maybe the call to arms for all industries, uh, is that Microsoft did that thing, you know, put that Xbox adaptive controller out there, but now what we see is the games houses are getting on board and saying, hey, we want to do our bit. Logitech jumped in and said, why are all those switches so expensive? We'll do them for a fraction of the price. Yeah, you know, everyone got closer to the physically disabled community uh, at that point to just make real progress. And now what we're starting to see is that blind gamers are getting their settings put into the games. They're thinking carefully about the design. And if your game is not accessible in the gaming community, trust me, you'll hear about it, right? Because they're very vocal as well, right? You know, it's the, it's the millennials, right? Coming out and just, it's the post millennials, right? coming out and just going, what the hell, this game is not accessible, right? So so I think we can all look at that and say, there's, there's generally a seed that kicks this off. I think it's been the up to Google, to Apple, to Microsoft, to all these companies to do the technology OS thing. I think it's now gonna become a much more industry focused conversation. Yeah, I and I think that's exciting, yeah. And, and actually gaming is a great example of where the assumptions people make about what gamers are, you know, young teenage boys in bedrooms. Yeah, that's right. Actually, it's a much, much bigger and wider market. Yeah, yeah Susan, I stay up to one o'clock. I stay up to one o'clock in the morning playing Forza on occasion. We don't want to know about that. Thank you, <laughs> Susan. Uh, what questions do we have coming in? Would you like to share some with us? Yeah, sure. So we have three questions and a comment. So I'll give them to you one by one. The first one is: Do you feel that the current UK and EU R and D grant programs? are sufficiently aware of the huge disability problem and how do you manage it? That's from David in the audience. Robin or Neil, do you have any thoughts about that? I'm not 100% sure which grant programs that she's talking about, or he, sorry. Um, <laughs> but certainly the WHO, the World Health Organization is undergoing a global survey and different organizations in each country are kind of championing the the local um on the ground you know garnering responses from different stakeholders and it's about putting together a core at list that they that each country um you know advocates within each country can then lobby their local governments to say look guys this should be the core at that everyone needs and that should be funded through the public purse. So we have hearing aids made available at the moment, but not necessarily um, some other equally priced or much, much cheaper alternatives in the assistive technology realm that would help overcome um, someone's disability. And we've talked about how a lot of it is built in and it absolutely is. Narrator in Windows 10 is absolutely brilliant now and will be fit for purpose for an awful lot of uh, different um, you know, people's requirements, potentially you know, in employment as well. But there is loads of instances where the built-in isn't going to be exactly the right thing for individuals. So I you know, value the, the scripting power that's built in to JAWS where an inaccessible app or website can be um, 
you know, scripted in a way that I will be able to do my job. And it could be the difference between keeping a job or not for many people. So that, you know, there is definitely a need for third party, as Neil mentioned before, where the, the real expertise, you know, fills a niche that, that mainstream doesn't at the moment and maybe never will. And there's a real discrepancy there. And it's a real, it's a short sighted strategy because for the sake of a few pounds now, that person may never be in in employment and we know yeah. the catch 22 of access to work here in the UK where you need to have a job offer before you can even start the very lengthy paper driven process where often it's not in place within the first eight months and so you you know you end yeah. up not being successful um you know if that isn't a firm contract so you know you're back at square one again etc I mean we could talk all day about we could challenges yeah. it, it, in fact, I just found myself nodding at you, Robin. So you honestly, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it wouldn't, you, you wouldn't be told that I was nodding, but I was nodding. Um, and, yeah, so, and, I'm, and I'm sure if Mike Short was on the call, I mean, I know he does tireless work behind the scenes and making sure this does get raised. But it, but it's a very good point, David, because it, in terms of a stakeholder, then yes, governments are stakeholders, you know, city authorities are stakeholders, there's benefits for the cities, there's benefits for the local councils, everybody. You know, and I think that's what's important here is that it, it touches everybody, uh, not just because they, they might be related to someone with a disability or they might meet somebody with a disability, but actually the way in which people live within society, work within society, play within society, it's going to affect every aspect of that. So, yeah. Sorry, Robin. Chris, you if, if, if I can, uh, Please, I, no. think, I think, you know, adding to, to Robin's point about uh, the APL, the Assisted Product List, um, that's a great initiative and, and every country needs to do it. They are focused on low tech as well. They want to ensure that, that some of the, the very basic things that enable people's lives to be lived in, in, a, in a meaningful way get counted as assistive tech. So, so that includes things like glasses, uh, sanitary pads, uh, walking sticks and canes and so on, as well as the, the sort of digital tech. And I think that that data gathering exercise and understanding the commonality and also the differences in different countries is important for informing policy making and research. But I think if we go to the to the question about the sort of EU funding, is it known enough? No. Uh, is there enough funding on specific inclusion projects as a whole as a whole in terms of our long term innovation projects? Also, no. I think that it's going to get better. Uh, obviously, the, the, the EU has published recently a, a disability strategy for 2030. So they've got a 10 year timeline where uh, it's clearly about participation in society and democracy, et cetera. So they're going to have to fund it. But what they need to also do is align with the vision of my old boss, who happens to be the EU commissioner for the internal market now, Thierry Breton, with his 2030 digital strategy for the whole of the, the internal market of the EU, because those two need to be aligned for us to be fully included. So, so there's some work to be done there, but there is also a, a will to do it. So I think that, are we there yet? No, again, glass half full. Can we get there? Yes, I think we can. And, and, and Francis, any comments from the, from the US side or what you've seen with your work with the UN on on sort of funding coming in from government and other authorities? Yeah, the, in the US, um, well, we, with the new administration, and you see actually a pretty dramatic change. And from day one, for example, the White House um, talked to, you know, published to the Biden administration's uh, White House to be to fully accessible. And just a couple of weeks ago, there was executive uh, directive coming out of the White House office talking specifically about disability inclusion and accessibility. So for those of us who are in the accessibility world has been looking to have accessibility be part of the DEI discussion, because as we all know, a lot of times it's unintentional, but you know, sometimes a lack of knowledge to include that. And another area that I see a lot of action, because that's where I spend a lot of my time, is in the startup area, in the investor communities. You're beginning to see that this whole concept of impact investment or this ESG, like we talked about earlier, are beginning to, to influence um, uh, the, the thinking, at least. Now, we're, we're still not at the actioning part, but again, the US uh, at the policy level, 
um, yesterday I was on a call, apparently the uh, SEC, which is a stock exchange uh, organization committee is thinking about, you know, asking uh, diversity, you know, of a listed company to have diversity board. And when the, the discussion is that we got to make sure that people with disability is, is, is part of that versus just gender, because today a lot of discussions on the gender but we need to make sure age and also uh, ability side is also yeah. a big part of that. So I think going back to like Neil, I'm very optimistic um, that uh, that they are change coming. Um, but again, it's on each person's responsibility to vote for the government and vote for the representative that actually, you know, align their value with ours to bring that in because we we know the opposite could also happen. Absolutely. Good. Susan, we've got a couple of minutes to end this section. You said there's one other question and one comment. Yeah, so you've actually covered another one of the questions, really, which was about sort of the economics and salaries. So yeah, okay. it was how can disabled people pay for the glasses or smart pens when they're earning a lot less salary? So I think you sort of covered that. So um, another question from the floor then, and that's probably all we've got time for. Um, where are the biggest gaps in your experience? And that's to the whole panel. Where are the biggest gaps? Hector, do you want to comment on the biggest gaps in accessibility? I think it's coming through the chat, if I'm honest. Uh, I think true, true global assistive technology, I think, is, is, is the next frontier that, that we need to aim at. If you, if you think where assistive technologies come from, particularly as we've come from kind of specialist provision uh, through to mainstream, uh, you know, it's come from well-funded, culturally developed markets. Uh, you know, I seem to have spent more life, more of my more of my life in Scandinavia than I have in Africa, right? Uh, <laughs> and and that's the challenge uh, is yeah. we we need to you know as as we think of kind of digital infancy essentially in some countries around the world or some markets around the world, it's about putting accessibility and disability inclusion right at the start. Uh, and I think you know we we need to be much more deliberate about it. We haven't done it yet, you know. And, and just putting my hand up at Microsoft is. You know, we've gone where people are buying our products most, right? And where the demand for accessibility is to have those conversations. Uh, part of my role is to is to really help scale this out around the world. But I, I would say that's probably our biggest challenge. So it's that it's that diagram. I, I want someone to draw this this uh, picture for me in PowerPoint of what is included in <laughs> included in inclusion, right? You know, is it because it's digital poverty? It's a, it's geographic. You know, it's financial, economic. It's employment. You know, we know a lot of disabled people struggle to get get employment, but we're, we're going to come on to that in a minute. Um, I'm going to was was there one more comment, Susan? Because I'm going to close yes, off. Yes, actually, there's just one. Sorry, Francis, did you go on, Francis? I would quickly. just add that there is actually to me there is a mindset gap. Um, at the top level, you know, you see the difference like the Microsoft CEO can make you know, when he's aligned, right? But I think for most part, a lot of our C-suites and board members still cannot match the concept of inclusion is about innovation. And that, you know, therefore they, they, they view it as a do good, do good. So more, more of a charity and in some cases, the legal compliance. But to me, if we can begin to think about digital, the question is, is digital transformation that every CEO you know, under the sun is thinking about what they think about digital inclusion. If they do that, then we know we're successful. Good. Very, very good point. And, and I think Crosby has had so many mentions that we're really bigging you up, Crosby, for when you when you come and join us in the next section. Um, so I'll draw that to, to a conclusion now. Uh, but to say to everybody, you know, of course, please join us at the end when we've been through the second section. Uh, we know there's plenty more uh, depth of knowledge and contributions to be made. But for, for now, Thank you very much. And if, if we were in a, uh, a large auditorium, you would you will be receiving a rapturous round of applause for that contribution. Thank you to Francis, to Robin, to Neil and to <laughs> Hector and also, of course, to Mike Short. So that, that brings us to the, to the end of that first piece. That's the stakeholders. I hope that's given people a, a good indication of the, the issues that are on the table. It's given us some hints about where things are going to go. In the second sort of half of the discussion, we're now going to move into this, this the, the industry in the future. You know, where, where does this go? And since we're talking about you know, mobile as part of the, the mobile ecosystem forum, uh, we obviously turn to some of the, the, the telcos. So in the next section, we're going to hear on video 
from Larry from Verizon. We're going to hear from uh, Gavi, uh, uh, Geo about the uh, the captioning. We're going to hear from Francois from Orange. We're going to hear from Cros the much the much vaunted uh, Crosby from the Valuable Five Hundred, uh, Serena from. Uh, Racket and Viber, and finally from Christopher from Google. So we've got a fantastic second half. So I'm sure you're 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 ready to take on board the next set of information. Um, and so could everyone else please turn their videos off? And Sam, could you please play Larry's video? Larry, welcome to the MEF event. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Can you give us a bit of background about where you come from, your experience in accessibility and your role at Verizon? Absolutely, and thanks for having me on. Um, I am based in Boston and I've been in Boston for quite a while. Uh, I am head of accessibility for Verizon Media, which is division of, of Verizon Corporation. Uh, and in my, in my role at Verizon Media, I work with a team to make all of our products and services, our content, as accessible as possible to people with disabilities uh, on our apps, on our websites, on all of our media. Uh, I came to this world uh, through WGBH Public Broadcasting in Boston, where captioning was invented, audio description was first developed for television. And uh, I created the National Center for Accessible Media there, which got me into a whole variety of ways of standards and policy and best practices and consulting to help uh, the industry really get up their game on accessibility. Excellent. So uh, long standing major contributions over the years. And I know when we've discussed this, we've talked about the, the progress, and this was mentioned in the report, the progress in technology and the, the, the advances that people like myself with vision impairment have, have benefited from, but many people with different disabilities. There, there's some lovely phrases that you came up with in, in our discussion, and perhaps we just, you can get, take us through those. So the first of those was shift left. What does shift left mean? Yeah, for, for many of us who've worked in this field for quite a while, we often would find a new piece of technology, a piece of media, uh, long after it had gone into the mainstream market. And that's when we started trying to fix it, repair it, bolt on some remediation. And not only is it highly inefficient, it, it's really quite tedious and often fails. So the mindset among many people who work in accessibility these days is get as close to the initial development uh, origination of the product uh, and make sure that the design is accessible and that any potential barriers are anticipated way in front. So the idea is shift to the left to the very start of any piece of technology or media and start building an accessibility then. Brilliant. And then uh, the second phrase is born accessible. Well, even before the concept arises, you should be embedding accessibility into your mindset. Uh, make accessibility uh, part of your thinking and process. So our idea is, and we didn't invent it, it came from people at a Benetech, a company out in California, where the notion is technology should come right out of the initial launch, fully accessible, born accessible. Uh, and uh, as you and I have talked, the notion is not only that it starts out accessible, but technology is upgraded constantly. So the second half of that is no regression. The notion is do not break the accessibility when you're upgrading your product. And it just happens way too often. And this is where we hear from our users with disabilities who say, please don't break it. You finally gotten your accessibility right. And then you did a dot to upgrade and I'm starting all over. So no regression is almost as important as board accessible. And, and I think especially as we move into this era of more software centric design, you know, we're moving away from dedicated hardware in many cases, that that software issue, it's so easy to update software. And in the world of IT, we talk about DevOps and moving away from the big old waterfall approaches. So by definition, it's even more critical to have no regression when we refresh apps uh, and, and move things through the system. For sure. And, and then 
perhaps finally, given that you're in the media and a lot of the time accessibility is discussed around, you know, the office environment and the consumer environment, anything specific to the media industry uh, that, that exists today that you're, you think is, is very unique? And then anything which you think is exciting around the accessibility world, any technological developments that you think are coming through that are really going to change the game? Well, I think things really have changed as much as anyone who relies, for instance, on closed captioning or audio description may be frustrated on a daily basis. When I first started in this area, uh, trying to get television networks to closed caption their media, and this goes back to 1985, it was a struggle trying to convince producers of make sure captioning was built into the production pipeline. I have to say today, as we move from linear and analog media to streamed video on demand and fully digital, it's gotten a lot easier. Of course, one of the reasons is regulation and, uh, and litigation, uh, but many companies who produce media now consider closed captioning table stakes and, and we're hoping to see the same for audio description. Uh, have to say I, I'm a great admirer of Apple and if you look at video on the Apple TV site you will often find a TV program that is described in 11 different languages <laughs> which is pretty awesome to see uh, so I think the world of production is finally building it in uh, and recognizing uh, it is an essential component of your production process. Now, those of us who have been working from home for the past year and a half uh, have realized all of a sudden there's some new barriers. Uh, all of the video conferencing systems that we've been using started out kind of rough. Uh, but I, I have to say they upgraded and uh, got their act together pretty fast so that now we'll see captioning that is widely available, either using automatic speech recognition or uh, a human captioning, uh, which often is still better these days, uh, though ASR is getting better. I'd say it's not quite ready for prime time yet in a general notion. Audio description still uh, is lagging uh, again. Uh, and as we start rolling out new forms of media, I think, uh, though virtual reality technologies have been around for quite a while, particularly in the gaming world, there is a really growing interest in how do we make uh, what you might call XR, augmented reality, virtual reality, extended reality, fully accessible to people with sensory disabilities, physical disabilities, cognitive disabilities. And I've been really lucky to collaborate with a large group of people through our XR Access Initiative, and people can find information at xraccess.org. And we are seeing some amazing, uh, brilliant, innovative ideas that are just now going to be implemented in the marketplace on captioning in a 360 environment, description that is served up to you via hotspots in a virtual world haptic feedback. There's just so many opportunities. Anyone who's interested in innovation, the virtual reality accessibility is really fun. It is great, isn't it? I, it when I did the original research into this uh, in 2014, 15, um, I quoted the $6 million man and said we could probably do it for $100,000 in that time. I suspect that price is coming down even more. And with, with your XR, I'm sure that will help tremendously. Larry, you've done some fantastic work in the area. Thank you very much for that from those of us using a lot of it. Uh, keep up the great work and we look forward to interacting with you again in the near future. Happy to be here. Thanks for asking. So I think you can see the, the, the story building and as we move into this into this next section about future opportunities and possibilities. So Larry there touched upon augmented reality, touched upon some of the issues in there. Uh, but he also, a lot of his original work has been around uh, captioning. And I'm delighted now to welcome uh, not only a, a panelist speaker, but also our, our sponsor uh, for the day, uh, Gio Galvez, who's VP of uh, Business Development for SyncWords. Gio, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd love to start my video, but uh, I just need someone to enable that. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Giovanni Galvez from Syncwords, New York. And um, I, I'd like to tell you, you know, uh, talk a little bit about the state of things for virtual events, especially captioning for real time in 2021. This is something I have a little slide deck that I'm going to uh, accompany with my uh, thing. And, you know, when, when this whole thing happened, this pandemic, it really shifted the captioning industry and put it onto a tailspin, you know, like we saw uh, the broadcasters cancel all sports, all the live events and uh, conferences and all sorts of things ended up becoming virtual. And, uh, and so there was all of a sudden a surge of need to be able to caption live virtual events, right? And these events happened 24 seven. There was a, a shortage of captioners available at all times of the day, scheduling a workforce. There was a lot of, of problems, right? I'm, I'm talking about people that work in the trenches that had to deal with this. There was also a demand for taking captioning that's live and translating that to multiple languages in real time. And that was something that, that we needed to solve. Um, but we couldn't like reinvent the wheel, right? We had to look at what we needed to do with what was there now, right? The existing live streaming workflows, the existing platforms that were there. And, um, and we couldn't touch the video. That was a big no-no, right, for, for live. Um, and, and there was no hardware really. Traditionally, if you don't know, for live captioning, it was originally designed to work with broadcast hardware, right? Like rack mount devices in the machine room that added captioning into a live signal. And none of that was there. In fact, even if uh, certain folks, including broadcasters, had access to that, you know, they were also working from home, doing the news from home. <laughs> and so there needed to be a different way to do the real-time captioning. And of course, scaling that, right, around the clock. Um, so what we did is we managed to figure out a way where we could not only connect the broadcast chain um, into the virtual event space um, and, and adapt the protocols for broadcast so that people can, uh, that our captioning can caption things like Zoom or they can caption WebEx or they could do virtual conferences, right? Without having to completely change their software, their workflow, their day in, day out type of protocols. And then that opened up an opportunity to get their accuracy, the high level of accuracy of the human captioner and leverage things like machine translation. Um, and that's something that, that actually is quite popular now, especially for virtual events, as now it's uh, you know, the, the, the boundaries of uh, where people can connect to the events is, is kind of no longer there, right? You don't have to get on a, on a plane to, to watch this conference, for example. You can just open up your Zoom. Um, the other aspect to it is, how the captioners started receiving the audio. You know, traditionally there was a phone bridge, there was all this machinery, there had special software so they could receive the audio and start typing. And now because Zoom is, is so popular, other things like Chime or, or even Microsoft Teams, um, captioners now are actually receiving the audio for live captioning through these uh, types of technologies, these low latency audio feeds from virtual uh, webinar platforms and meeting platforms. And they're very versed in that. That's a huge shift because before that, before 2020, it was always some proprietary device or some proprietary phone bridge that they received the audio from. So that's how they're able to get the audio to send the captioning live. Now there is live ASR, you know, I, I saw someone that uh, talked about that earlier and it has become better. However, because everyone's working from home, everyone has different microphones. And so the audio levels, the quality of the audio, background noise, 
it all is is affecting the live ASR. So in many cases for working from home virtual meetings, it's not very reliable. So human capture should be used whenever possible. And then of course, the MT, right? The MT is great because once we receive the captioning from the human, we can do all sorts of things with it, right? And we can put it onto a live stream. Uh, we see uh, broadcasters now taking advantage of that to grow their audience. Um, we can put it into something that works on the mobile phone so people can just select the languages that they want to, to, to read when they're watching the news or sports. And of course, in virtual events. Right now, even you know, as we're doing live captioning now, we can actually take that and translate it. So we had to move away from like the standard technologies, like something called CEA 608. And that is typically how live streaming works, at least generally speaking, for things like Facebook and Vimeo and YouTube. And we went with a different protocol altogether, something that doesn't touch the video. You know, when you're talking about CO8, it, it talks about live broadcast. It's really designed for the television broadcast space because they already have all those machineries, you know, uh, and the descriptions that you see that I put it down here, they talk about, you know, the, 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 the equipment that they have, the encoders that they have. Uh, the, the average uh, person that's doing a live event doesn't have access to any of that. And also there's limitations with that. You were only able to put one language. Um, it couldn't be an Asian language or a Unicode language. So taking that completely out of the equation was something we did in, in 2020 and now in 2021, it's become mainstream. We're now virtual platforms, um, even conference platforms, you know, the live streaming workflow is completely separate from the captioning workflow. The captioning is actually just sending the data, the text in a way that viewers can consume it. And so there's really very low risk in doing captioning for live streaming now because we've adapted to that, right? And it was a, a, a quite, a, quite a feat to do it in such a short amount of time, but it's something that we can do. And we see now in Zoom, as mentioned earlier, you can turn the captions on and off. Um, later, I'll actually put a link in the chat. You guys can actually see the translations if you're interested. And, um, and so what's the future hold? Really, this is kind of the last part of my presentation, you know, because we're, we're leveraging now uh, real-time captioning, new protocols, delivery to virtual conferences. We see that now with, with Zoom, WebEx, and all sorts of other things, live streaming. But what about voice? This is something that we're experimenting with where the voice can also take advantage um, uh, of the actual uh, timing, the uh, proper grammar and punctuation that a live captioner can provide us, and then have that translated in voice, so text-to-speech, uh, rather than speech-to-text, in another language. But even going beyond that, some of the things we've experimented with is to be able to um, really look at the inflections, the emotions of the, the actual speaker. So I'll play something for you. Here's someone you may recognize, Dr. Fauci, uh, doing a, like a, a presentation here. The seasonal flu that we deal with every year has a mortality of 0.1%. The stated mortality overall of this, when you look at all the data, including China, is about 3%. So all of that was captioned. The timing was done. Everything is, is there. And now here it is in Spanish using AI. La gripe estacional con la que lidiamos cada año tiene una mortalidad de un décimo por ciento. La mortalidad declarada en general de esto cuando vemos toda la información, incluyendo China, está cerca del 3%. Esto the and so with that example, um, you saw that, you know, like we're able to also using AI, we're able to measure the original speaker. And when we do the, 
the, the, the text to speech in another language, we're able to capture the nuances of the way he speaks, his timing, his delivery. And this is something that we feel is going to be the future, especially for, for folks that require, you know, localization. Let's say uh, there's people who, um, you know, let's say are, are, are blind, but they speak a different language. So this is another way that this could be leveraged. Um, so we're very excited about what the future holds. Um, we feel that these technologies can be readily uh, be delivered for both live and pre-recorded media. And, uh, and with that, you know, uh, I think the future is bright, you know, and, and I guess when you say, you know, when you get lemons, you make lemonade. And in the case of uh, 2020 and 2021, with the huge shift to digital delivery, a live delivery, virtual events, meetings, webinars, um, we feel that all of these technologies can be leveraged to add a more, uh, a better a more accessible and better user experience for everyone. Um, so with that, I, I, I you know, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful to be included in this panel, and um, and I'd love to know if there's any questions or. Uh, we, we'll we'll come on to questions at the end. You know, we, we'll, we'll run through the other things first, and then come back to that. But you, you know, you music to my ears because uh, I my degree was in computational linguistics back in the early '80s. And we were building the early systems that started to do that machine translation from French to German and German to English. So brilliant, great, great stuff. And it's, and it's good to see. Um, we'll, as I say, we'll run through the other presentations and then come, come back to Q&A at the end. So, um, Sam, if you could, could you please uh, run the video? We, we now have input from uh, Francois René Germain, who is the chief group chief accessibility officer and head of innovation at Orange. Francois, we're delighted to have you with us at the MEF Accessibility event. Uh, welcome to the conference. It's a pleasure. It's a great pleasure for me. Um, I wish you all the best for your event. Sorry not to be with you, but I've got some uh, commitment uh, otherwise, but uh, I wish you all the best. I'm very honored to be invited by yourself. Well, um, my title, <laughs> formal title, is the Group uh, Chief Accessibility Officer. Um, in charge of our disabled and elderly customers uh, worldwide, that is in 26 countries, in fact, uh, for all the chain of value, including strategy, uh, port marketing, including uh, communication, public affairs, regulation. And um, I've got also uh, some items about uh, social offers, business with social impact, as well as eco-conception for in the environment. So all in the rationale of um, CSR, but I've created from scratch, in fact, um, in 2003, the mission for the disabled customers. And we, we began, first of all, um, on the orange friends footprint. And afterwards, we enlarged scope with elderly people. And afterwards, we enlarged uh, to the old footprint of Orange worldwide. Um, we, we, we are used to um, managing um, more than 2,500 files um, for adapting, in fact, the working place uh, for um, organizing digital equipment for disabled employees could be um, accessibility for websites, portals, or obviously uh, job application. Um, and, and so we, uh, just to finish, we have got a budget of 1 million point six uh, euro uh, in research and development, only dedicated to our disabled employees for obviously adapting their working place, for uh, hiring uh, disabled employees, for organizing the equipment such as wheeler center for deaf or, or, or hearing impaired um, employees using, uh, in fact, uh, sign language, for example. Uh, so, so, and we have the mirroring because I'm responsible uh, only for the innovation for um, uh, the uh, disabled customers, uh, employees, sorry, <laughs> responsible of all the value for 
disabled customers, but only innovation for disabled employees. But there is a mirroring, and, and because they are the best testers we can imagine uh, belonging to our company before launching those uh, dedicated or adapted products and services uh, to the market. And the way you, the way you describe this innovation, this new new engine, how do you see that with your customers and your disabled customers beginning to? What, what sort of experience do you think they get from the Orange's approach? Well, it's very simple. First of all, we have got um, from scratch, from the beginning, I mean, an ethnographic approach. We have got a, a culture of engineer uh, within Orange framework, but we have to observe the daily life, the practical life of our customers, disabled customers, I mean, and they just tell us uh, how they can invent new uses from uh, for uh, current uh, products or services, uh, which kind of service we have to invent, we have to, to build. Um, and, and so the first step is the customer, the customer, and in terms of uh, um, collective uh, ideation, in fact, in terms of so we've got we've got panels we've got barometers we've got a market study field research we've got a, a huge number of partnerships with disabled associations mm -hmm. obviously uh secondly secondly we never think uh, to see uh, disabled people market only but we always make the link with a silver economy so we thanks to the disabled um, customers or, or employees because they they are working under constraints and they have to invent new uses and they are like a pilot of formula one uh, which is very useful for any kind of people uh, driving a, a normal car afterwards you know uh, we take benefit from all of these innovations coming from disabled uh, employees and customers and so we are able capable to integrate accessibility thanks to all of these requirements and um, all of these um, uh, remarks coming from this network in our products mass product, mass market product and services it means that, that we we are working in the same same spirit for disabled customers and uh, elderly people you know and and so it's what we we call but everyone knows that <laughs> the name i mean it's designed for all uh, obviously approach thirdly as i told you previously we've got a fully integrated of value i have in my hand the strategy and what was the chain um and, and with including open innovation obviously because we were very hard with the startups we, which are more specialized are ourselves and that can uh, implement our portfolio of uh, dedicated services uh, very very uh, very well uh, so we put human being we put humanity in our customer relationship we put humanity in our uh, retail shops uh, network network we put humanity in considering our products and services and we never forget that we are first of all human being and thanks to disabled people, we can invent more and more that we can imagine. Uh, Francois, thank you very much for your time. We're delighted you could contribute to this event. Uh, keep up the great work at Orange, and I look forward to, uh, to you sending me a pair of those glasses in the not too distant future. <laughs> thank you very much, and uh, good luck for your event. Thank you. Bye-bye. The, the the glasses he mentioned, we he, we cut the bit of the video out actually, because uh, he mentioned he'd been he tried on a pair a pair of glasses. He wouldn't say who they were from, but Robin, they were obviously something that that, that we've been discussing earlier. So I think you gather there uh, really interesting, and in fact, uh, in discussing this with uh, with Francois, um, his boss that kicked this thing off in, uh, originally was actually uh, Neil, your boss, Thierry Breton, when he was the head of uh, Orange or France Telecom at the time. So yeah, that leadership issue keeps coming out time and time again. And that, and that leads us nicely to, the, to, to, to Crosby Cromwell. Crosby, delighted to have you with us from the Valuable 500. 
uh, you've, people have been, been referring to what you've been doing uh, and the, the, the whole organization and what you've achieved. Would you like to explain that to the wider audience and give your perspective on the topic of pe people with disability? Sure, and thank you, Chris. I mean, so much has been said from the brilliant panelists already that I could almost say ditto and turn my you know video back off and be done for the day. But you know, thank you for Neil and others who have called out what the Valuable 500 is doing and are part of our initiative. I mean, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Verizon, Orange are all Valuable 500 companies and are leading this work forward. I'll tell you about what, what that means in just a minute. But to begin with an audio description, I'm coming to you from my apartment in Washington, DC. I have long red hair, skin that will always burn in the sun, even though I wish it wouldn't. And I'm wearing a, a green shirt today. So really thrilled to be having this conversation. I am the Chief Partnerships Officer for The Valuable 500, which is a B2B initiative driving disability inclusion further through the business ecosystem, specifically with 500 companies. And we are here to talk about the, the future and, and what is coming. We are actively in conversation with our companies, hearing what they're doing for their own individual commitment statements, how they're moving and working and learning from the collective as a whole. I mean, really what we're seeing right now, I think Andrew, Chris said it best in one of the first, you know, one or two sentences opening the entire session up that the, the timing is right. I have spent 20 years in this space and have never seen a better op opportunity than what we are experiencing at this moment to actually like truly, truly not lip service, move this, this work forward. I think there are a couple of reasons why that's, why that's happening. We need to point out that if the statistics are still bleak. And it's important to talk about that and understand it. Unemployment statistics are still high. Healthcare was sent into a tailspin, of course, um, with COVID last year and was already bleak in some spaces in the disability community. Wage gap is a real issue. But on the other side of that, the optimism is high. And I think there are a few things that are converging. One, business is in this. I mean, look at the companies who've already spoken today. These, aren't, these are huge global heavy hitters who are doing this because it, it matters not only for their employee base, but from a consumer B, you know, P and L perspective to hit the bottom line that innovation around disability, accessibility, inclusion matters and brings money into the company. So business is on board. I think the second thing that is converging with the timing being right is that the disability community itself and individuals with disabilities are growing in power around their disability identity. I mean, what Neil puts out on his podcast is brilliant. And I would suggest as well, others have already said to, to follow it. But also if you wanna dip into this conversation, look at the hashtag disability Twitter to learn how broad and wide this is and where the expectation and the demands are starting to come from the disabled consumer who want to be seen and heard, who, who wants you to understand that they have buying power. And I think the third thing that as a part of all of this timing being right is what happened last year with COVID-19 and this pandemic where we all were, were put into a tailspin in a way that we shared communally. Uh, it was a global occurrence to uh, the point that was just made um, in the last video. I think we got to honest a lot faster last year and there was a humanity that rose out of this experience. We are talking about mental health differently. We're thinking about it. We're including it in all of our conversations in a different way. And if we can capitalize on humanity of what came out of last year combined with what we're seeing come from business around disability innovation, there is no going back. So to, Larry, to Larry's point about table stakes, this is where table stakes comes in for disability inclusion. You know, as we talk to our companies, we're learning about the many ways in which they're, they're advancing it, they're driving it, they're embedding it. Um, there was a point made, I think Neil talked about the FTSE study that we put out um, in conjunction with Tortoise Media that did show again some of those bleak statistics where zero CEOs within the FTSE 100 have identified as having a disability at this point. Um, it's eight companies are reporting their disability data, 12 companies, I'm sorry, are reporting their disability data externally. Eight more are reporting it internally. So 20 total, 20 total of the FTSE 100. We need more. We need deeper conversation. We need more public conversation. We need CEOs coming forward. But here's the thing that's being led out of the Valuable 500, which are five comp 500 companies led by 500 CEOs who've said, you know, this is a moment in time. 
uh, and it's a stake in the ground that they are willing to make and to be open to talk and work with uh, quote unquote competitors in this space. We're already seeing these kind of conversations come up and, and take place. I have had fascinating uh, discussions with companies like Auto Trader through what they're doing around really interesting techniques for self disclosure internally or up to 13% of their employee base um, disclosing a disability. Barclays, of course, at 14%. Um, we, we are working with Intertech, one of our companies who you may know, a global company who focuses on risk management, has reached out to 15 plus companies within the Valuable 500 Collective to look at disability travel and inclusion travel from end to end, from the moment you get in the cab to headed to the airport, to the what you'll expect in your hotel, to what you'll want from entertainment. The, the consumer is dan demanding more and companies are, are rising to are rising to those table stakes that Larry talked about. Thank you very much, Crosby. The, the, what, what is fascinating is that once you do get those discussions going at the high level, then it does filter down fantastically throughout, throughout the organization. So it seemed to be led from the top, then, then we all benefit. Um, Moving on, we have another video contribution. Uh, Serena, Selena Chan uh, from Rakuten Viber was going to join us in person and then travel plans changed. So Sam, could you please roll the video from Selena from Rakuten Viber? Hi everyone, I'm Serena. I'm the International HR Director at Rakuten Viber. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Susan and Chris for putting together this discussion. I really hope that I could have joined live along with a great panelist, but nonetheless, I'm excited to be speaking with everyone on the very important topic of accessibility in the workplace, specifically Viber's take and the challenges of inclusion in the global atmosphere. Um, at Viber, we're 400 employees spread across the world in Western Europe, CIS, Central Eastern Europe, Asia Pacific, as well as over in Israel. Um, we are still growing in terms of headcount and global offices. Um, we are lucky to say that we are diverse in many aspects and proud to say that as an employer, we are fair and equal. Um, this is deeply rooted in our DNA as a company. Um, we have been nurturing this internally and have been quietly doing what we know is right and is needed to be done. Um, we don't necessarily have these shiny employer branding programs that showcase our diversity, inclusion, and equality. Rather, we choose to ensure we are developing this value at the core of our HR practices when it comes to recruitment practices processes, um, HR conversations, and much more. Um, many may see this and, and say that, you know, it's a very passive approach, um, which is not at all our take. As we see it, equality and fairness in the workplace does not and should not start and stop with external marketing. It needs to be at the core of the DNA seen in the practices, in the conversations, and um, further from that, you know, really grow with the business. In the case of fairness and equality in the workplace at Viber, um, it's built on the character of the first line of defense, the gatekeepers, if you will. Um, this is our leadership team. This is our hiring team. Um, it is built on the common values and experiences that a group of individuals actively chose to amplify in the organization. They set the tone um, for this value and they set the tone that it should not be a debate at any level of do we or do we not consider someone with a disability for employment. Um, this value that we have created um, needs to be protected. As I shared, Viber is also a growing company and we too need to find ways to best preserve our best practices um, when it comes to this value. And one of the uh, top things that we focus on is prioritizing questions, concerns, comments coming in about fair opportunities. It's never a let's talk about it later type of conversation, um, being that equality and fairness is currently deeply rooted in our company. We also realize that um, it is something that can quickly disappear if we let it. Um, so we always make sure that you know this is something that we make time for and that we take very 
very sensitively and making sure that we involve stakeholders in the right conversations as well. Um, in addition, uh, we do make it our responsibility to take the time to understand the markets that we employ in. The topic of equality in general and more specifically accessibility in the workplace is not perceived the same in all corners of the globe. Um, so in many places that we are, you know, exploring or looking to hire, um, it is different from, from country to country, region to region, even sometimes city to city. Um, so when it comes to recruitment, for example, um, we can see, you know, that in some regions, age, gender, disabilities, and uh, many other very personal details are required in CVs. Um, it's not in our purview to judge, um, but it's more so for us to share a perspective that as a global company, that we do not need this information and that we are in no way using this information when we are um, looking to process your CV, when we're interviewing you and considering you for the role. Um, another example uh, being that in some regions, you know, some employees are and may not be as open to share um, about their disability because of the fear of shame um, based on maybe their previous experiences, uh, maybe uh, based on, you know, the local uh, culture. Um, but, you know, it's on us as a company to be sensitive, um, to be active and to be personal with that individual in terms of you know, sharing available resources and making sure that they can thrive as much as possible, whether it is in the interview process or um, within the company itself. So with that said, um, I want to leave the message, especially for growing organizations that it's not about appearing to have things figured out. Um, it's really about you know, being open to advancing and finding a way to allow for such topics to be deeply enrooted and, and to truly be able to say that this is the value of your company. Um, on top of that, it is about bettering ourselves to serve the communities that we employ in and that we are part of. Thanks for everyone's time and thank you again to Chris and Susan for organizing this panel um, and discussion. Um, I hope to be talking to many other industry members uh, regarding fairness, equality, as well as accessibility in the workplace. Take care, everyone. I think that that theme, I think that that uh, issue of humanity that Francois started and then Selena picked up on there, really, really important. There's a lot of technology around, but we need to remember the humanity side at the end of it. And finally, in terms of our expert witnesses, contributors, I'm so delighted to welcome you, Chris Patno, Christopher Patno from, from Google. I think um, your, your title is something like Head of Accessibility and Digital Inclusion uh, within Google. Uh, obviously, you've been referred to in, in many of the references already. Um, and thank you for getting up early on, on the West Coast. Uh, next time, you might not be so early Well, if you're going to move to us. Um, we'd love to hear your perspective. Please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Chris, and the rest of the folks at, at, at ABF for the opportunity to participate. And thank you to all of the other panelists. I've been really inspired by your wisdom and your insights. And I'm, I, I have to say, this morning I had a shower thought. So what I'm going to be sharing today is, is mostly extemporaneous. Um, I changed what I wanted to talk about based off of what I thought of this morning. What occurred to me is that we have a, sh a parallel in the shift of the medical model of accessibility to the social model of accessibility and technology. Those people who don't know, the medical model of, of accessibility is that disability is something that needs to be fixed. The social model, the social model is that the disability can be accommodated. So it seems to me that there's a parallel in the medical model of dedicated AT to the social model of mobile devices, where the dedicated AT is, is a, a piece of hardware that's made to fix something, and the, the social model is an accommodation device. And it, so taking this one step farther, this reminds me of the movie, The Incredibles from Pixar, where the, the character Syndrome said, if everybody's super, no one is. Which means to me, if, if everyone is using AT, like speech to text, ASR and captions, it's no longer AT, it's just technology. 
So my proposal is that like the old expression about 10 years ago about cell phone cameras, the best AT is the one that you have with you. Mobile devices can interpret the world around you, both digital and physical, using innovative technologies like AI, artificial intelligence, computer vision, and machine learning. But, and this is something that occurred to me a while I was listening to the conversation today, there's a balance of compute versus cost, especially when you start looking at emerging markets that needs to be managed. Less expensive phones can do less because their processes are, 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 are smaller or older than more expensive and more powerful phones. So that's where you have a solution like cloud computing that like Francis mentioned, here cloud compute can help. An example of this from Google is Live Transcribe. Live Transcribe is an application on Android that can literally uh, transcribe over 80 different languages in real time. You can tap your responses and we can even provide sound notifications of your name being spoken or of environmental sounds happening around you like a, a dog barking or, or a baby crying. And these are made possible because of the power of cloud compute. And as an aside, what's cool for me about this is that this is actually started as, as a project between two people, um, one person who was deaf and one person who was hearing who wanted to work together. So you have this extremely exciting technology like AI and, and automatic, soft, uh, um, a, automatic software recognition, automatic speech recognition, sorry, I've been up since five o'clock this morning. Um, you have ASR and empower these opportunities where you can't get a live captioner. So you have this technology powered by the cloud that helps people. So since cloud computing can give access to more powerful models, it allows cheaper phones to do amazing things, but it requires a data connection, which isn't always readily available. So what's exciting here is the recent advances in the miniaturization of machine learning models so they can run on device like what, what Hector called the edge. And this works, this allows more powerful phones to do more, more in a local and private way, but you still can't do as much as you could with the cloud. So here's that balance between powerful phones doing more, but less powerful phones doing even more, but you have to have a data connection. So an example of this coming from Google is, is live caption. This is a feature on, on Android that will provide captions for you on any, any, almost anything on your device, that if it doesn't have captions, we can provide captions for you as a, as a system setting, as a system feature. And these, again, these are these captions are, are processed locally in on, on the edges, as Hector called out. And what we did is we took lessons from live transcribe of what was important and what people wanted to do. And based off that feedback, we created this new feature. And when, because of working with the community, we have expanded this functionality just from content like, like Instagram video or, or, or TikToks to phone calls. So now you can actually use live caption on phone calls and people can have, have there's a fellow, fellow, fellow by the name of Matthew Johnson at ThoughtWorks out of the UK. He posted a really great art, uh, posting about how he had his first phone call with his son because of live caption because he could read what his son was saying and he, could, and he was verbal so he could speak back and they had a real conversation. For me, this is the powerful thing that, that technology can provide. And we have also an application called Lookout which uses computer vision to describe text, banknotes and the world around you for people with, with um, vision difficulties. And this is a combination of both cloud and compute. So some things will be powered by the cloud and some things will be done, done locally. So we're trying to find that balance of where the most, the best functionality can be. And in all honesty, there's no right answer. There's no perfect answer because one person's need is, is different than another person's need. So you can't create a technology that meets everyone's need. The only way you can do something that meets the most of the people's need is, is to do it together. You build, you, you build with the community, you co-design with the community. In fact, the best way to do it is actually, is, as Hector mentioned, you have people on the team building the products. If that's not possible, then you co-design with the community. You, you test with the community. You take feedback from the community and feed this in. And when you do this, you can create technology that meets the needs of, of everyone. 
So in, in closing, and I, I apologize if this has been a bit rambling, technology is a really empowering force, but the requirements that needs to be balanced for, to make the most robust experience. You need to understand the cost versus compute versus privacy. You need to understand that no one person, there's no one perfect solution that, that meets everybody's needs. But technology can make these things happen. Technology can solve these things, but it has to be built alongside the community. So together we can create the future, but by being inclusive and intentional, we can create the, for the future for all. Thank you very much indeed, Christopher. In fact, as you're talking there, and I think this theme has come out sort of throughout the, all of the sessions about, you know, your technology is great, but there's got to be the human element, as Francois called it, the, the humanity. Um, you know, one of my favorite apps as a blind person is Be My Eyes, where uh, I was in a, a hotel room in China and used Be My Eyes to connect to a volunteer who used the camera on my phone to look at the air, look at the air conditioning controls and help me reset it where I couldn't get help locally. So I think that there is a fantastic blend of technology and human or, and humanity, which, which, which will allow us to do that. And, and I think, you know, Geo, it, it comes back to you and your and your captioning, you know, where actually the best captioning is done as, as we're seeing now, you know, done done by a human with those with that sort of skill set. And as the technology improves and as AI improves and we build more and more into that those systems, then that can get better and better and better. So I, I think we we're, we're at a stage of this where, yes, this, we've talked about the stakeholders and now we're talking about the future. I think, you know, we are I, I suspect we're getting nearer to two thirds glass full rather than rather than half full, half empty. So but that's that's perhaps why we're all on the call today and having that more positive approach. Uh, Dario, are you jo you're joining me for uh, for the for the questions for this uh, illustrious panel? And obviously, right. we can't get um, we can't get contribution from Larry or Francois or Selena, but they you know they, they've given us some some great food for thought. Uh, do we have any additional questions at the moment, Dario? Well, I have to say that Neil has done some great done some great work. He has answered a lot of the questions that we still have there. Uh, <laughs> The meanwhile, we'll come back to some of them. And um, there's one that just came through. Uh, so I will uh, read from David Wallace and I will read in a bridge version, pretty much. Um, how can all media services, as referring to the UK, BBC, ITV, uh, big broadcasters, be persuaded to include progress in disability as a major strategic step? Um, is that something you would like to take? Well, it's a, it's a, you know, in, encouraging, encouraging. I think it's the, it was referred to early on, wasn't it, with the, the, the stick and the carrot. You know, is, is it the stick of regulation or the carrot of the, of the, the service that the experience that people have? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that question. I don't know whether any of our previous panelists, whether Robin or, or anyone would like to come in as well. Sure, happy to, Chris, on at least some of it. So, I mean, I think the answer is that there's not enough yet, but that we're seeing more. Um, we're seeing um, broader representation. We're seeing better representation, um, you know, coming out of the BBC for sure, which is another valuable 500 organization. But the, we were passing around internally within our team yesterday, Channel 4, UK's Channel 4 has put out a brilliant uh, video highlighting the Paralympic Games in Tokyo that shows disability in a way that you need to see it. I'll put the link in the chat after we're done. But you know, as far as talking about representation, there's a um, Valuable 500 undertakes a global trends report that comes out quarterly that we do in conjunction with Mintel to talk about what we're seeing from the past quarter. And this is only for our membership, but to, to give some insight out to, to the group today on the event, what we saw out of the last quarter is a greater volume of representation specifically coming from the beauty and uh, fashion industry or who are using disability to storytell about what it means um, using individuals with disabilities. Uh, you know, Sinead Burke joined as one of the first um, or the first individual with disabilities as an editor at Vogue and is writing a, a, a line for them. I mean, we're starting to see more representation. It just needs to move more quickly. And, and we know that. Uh, it, it's fascinating. So, so Channel 4, if, if people get the chance to watch it, there is a, um, uh, I can't remember the guy's name now, he's, he's an Australian guy who's, who's a, an amputee, and he, he runs a show called The Last Leg, and that's part of the Olympic coverage. So Channel 4 has done a fantastic job by getting disabled people to present 
I know there's also issues around representation of disabled people in programming uh, that we come across. There's also the issue, of course, around encouraging to go back to the captioning and audio description side that we get a lot more audio described content. So I think it's permeating around many more aspects uh, of the industry. Geo, from, from your point of view, the, the technology, you, you touched upon it in your presentation, but, you know, where does it stop? You know, you, you mentioned the, the sort of simultaneous automatic translation language to language. You know, where does this go? I mean, are there, is there any end to it? Um, I, don't, I don't think there's end to it. I think uh, as long as there's a demand for, for accessibility, there's going to be future innovations. Um, I think in general, um, the thing that I've seen that's, that's the most interesting to me is in virtual reality, um, and uh, you know, there's there's even platforms now like AltSpace VR where uh, you're you're able to, you know, literally have spaces um, where you can actually speak to people in other languages, right, and converse with just one person while other people are conversing with other people. Um, so, looking at it in in the 3D space, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge to resolve. Um, as we move forward with uh, with technology, I, I think Larry touched upon this in, in his in his little speech, didn't he? That you know this notion of three hundred and sixty, and yes, what we're developing in the in the gaming and the VR world is is going to be applicable as as, as we we extend that. And in fact, I noticed obviously during during lockdown in in my technology sort of telecom industry analyst role, we've been subjected to endless webinars and endless content. And I've noticed how many more of them now are capturing the video content because they want to be inclusive with the video, but they're also taking that feed and, auto and automatically generating the text from it because, of course, that it's valuable content, you know. And we shouldn't lose sight of you know when when we're doing events like this, with especially with, with your captioning you've provided, that actually that content becomes consumable in different ways. You know, this this beauty of the digitization of media is that we we will. We will enjoy different ways of consuming it. I'm a massive audiobook fan, for example. I, I much prefer having someone read it to me, a human read it to me, because I spend all day listening to my computer jabbering away at me in that sort of like, you know, compute, compute to human type voice uh, that, 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 that is prevalent now on mobile devices and on, and on laptops. So, yeah, I think the, that, that notion of media, but I, th I think what's important here is that we're beginning to see so many different elements. So, we, we initially in early research focused on how do we define disability? How do we segment it? You know, what's the technology? And now we see, we're seeing this much more, much more wide ranging uh, issue that comes down from every aspect of, of our lives. Um, and, and Christopher, from, from a Google point of view, just some of the things coming down the line, I know you can't tell us about you know, the, the newer technology, but which, which aspects of the, of the of, I guess, even the broader alphabet group uh, as well as Google um, and, the, and the assistive technology and accessibility, are, are you most excited about? I have to say, I'm really excited these days about what we call Project Euphonia. And it is a technology that will allow people with non-typical speech patterns to be able to use voice technology, use your, your the, the, in our case, the Google Assistant, but it's the same technology that powers the Siri and Alexas. And what's really exciting to me, it's not, it's, it's, it's we're taking this euphonia technology, this broad speech model and voice models and allowing it to create voices for people who cannot speak. So there's a fellow by the name of Steve Gleason out here in the US who, and we just recently had um, a commercial where we actually had him, a recreated version of his voice in a commercial reciting some of some, something about the Lou Gehrig's disease. And it was a really, emotional and powerful thing hearing this man who hasn't spoken in a very very long time reading the words that were spoken by the person by Lou Gehrig the person who ALS has been been sort of nicknamed from so this speech technology for me is really interesting and really powerful and it's interesting isn't it you know in, in the in the original report I looked at what was then the emerging market of wearables and how we can, I say, with a six million dollar man, we can sort of re rebuild someone, or we can enhance uh, someone physically. Of course, we're also getting close to this. We believe this notion of actually 
interpreting brainwave to be for people who have locked in syndrome and the like. So yeah, once again, be, be able to create, literally give a voice to someone who is in a situation like that, both of course for learning medically, but also giving that person a much greater quality of life. Excellent. So, so, so Chris, um, Please, actually, Neil. We're, we're not on the cusp, that's actually happening. So um, you know, we, we've been talking with people like Natalia Kuzmina at MIT, they are already um, using um, brain computer interfaces and not embedded ones, but, but ones that, that, that are soft. So you, have a, you wear a headset mm -hmm. to enable people to, to control devices and to be able to communicate. So, so this, is, this is happening right now. And then uh, and also there's another group, which um, Larry, if he's here, would probably have told you about, which is called Cognition, uh, who are also building uh, BCI interfaces into headsets as well. So you've got um, brain computer interfaces and, and basically assistive tech built into to VR headsets. So, so it's here. Uh, it's just that the future is unevenly distributed as, as, as they say. So, so I, I think it's really exciting to see this stuff, but I'm also really interested in um, not just augmented reality, but peri-reality. Um, <laughs> and this, Go on, tell this me about the idea reality, of, yeah. of reduced reality, because there's someone that is overloaded, you know, with all of the content and all of the the sort of drinking from the fire hose, despite being addicted to Twitter. Because I can see Hector's eyebrows sort of raising here, <laughs> um, because I'm I'm a total media addict. It, it, it's actually how do we filter? How do we um, deal with sense making? And, and, and actually allow ourselves the peace and the calm to, to, to live a healthy mental life as well. Because actually there is this, this huge wave of anxiety that is, that is spread. And, and it's not just COVID, it's the effects of the technology that we're using to cope with COVID. Uh, the, you know, the, the always on the connectedness, the, the multi-channel, revolution and flood of information so the ability to use technology to also reduce what we need to consume and help expand uh, you know help us there and it needs to get more accurate microsoft have done a great job with things like filtered inbox it's just that it filters the wrong things at the moment the idea is fabulous i'm sure that it will learn and get better um so that we can start sort of actually sorting out the, the digital wheat from the digital chaff. I think that's an area that I'm also super interested in because for hidden disabilities and cognitive uh, impairments, this would be really, really useful. It's a really if interesting... Can, if, no, please go ahead. Sorry, if, for, for the sake of other nerds in the audience, if I can share two other companies that have done some really neat stuff. One is called a brain port, which is, which is a tongue sensor. You, you put a, 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 a sensor on your tongue and they have a camera on, on glasses. And what they've learned is that the brain can be reprogrammed to actually see using your tongue the, the, the content of this camera. It provides a, a context of edges. And the demo that I saw that was so interesting is they had a person who was blind able to, to kick a foot, to kick a, what you call a football, what we call a soccer ball um, on a field and, and walk along a track because it was able to find the edges so clearly. Second one is a, is a company called Neosensory, which, which does, um, they have created a bracelet that will tr essentially translate sounds in, into something that's, that's tactile. So people who are deaf, can, you can actually have someone, if you can train it to say your name and you can be told when your name is called because your, your bracelet will go off. So these are some really neat technologies that sort of expand the context to your, Chris, to your point of the, the, the $6 million man um, these are technologies that can in, in enhance people's um, senses. I, I think there was also, if I remember correctly, there was a um, a, a climber, a blind climber, who had a, a haptic pad on his tongue, which actually showed him the, the shape of the rock above him as he was climbing. I think that, that was around oh. a while ago. Sorry, I, I interrupted. I do beg your pardon. I, I was going to say that, um, I mean, these are great uh, user kind of facing technology that's, um, you know, is being developed, but, but there is also... I think the infrastructure and technology like blockchain, right? I mean, right now uh, people relate blockchain as uh, like a, a Bitcoin uh, investment. But if you think about the foundation of blockchain is about building trust, you know, uh, between parties. 
And we also know that people with disabilities or also the aging population of fraud, for example, financial fraud could be a huge, huge issue. And I see a lot of uh, potential uh, innovation in this area. Potentially, we can really guard, you know, the uh, to put, uh, put it a more of a defensive play to make sure that we uh, our citizens and, and users are protected. Another use of a blockchain that I thought was really interesting was that. Um, People, uh, a lot of times we use volunteer for this because we're talking about disability as a societal topic. So you want to enable the entire society. But when people volunteer their time, for example, to describe the environment and whatever, ideally they should be paid if they choose to, you know, for that, the effort. So using blockchain, one can identify the contribution of effort, you know, in align with the uh, the infrastructure. So I see that there is, so there could be monetization uh, potential to include even more participation from the society. So these are all fascinating technology that's that could be explored. And that is interesting, isn't it? Because the you know the the notion of be my eyes is a purely voluntary service, and yet in the US you've got IRA. I think IRA exists in other places as well, where it's a paid for by per minute as you get someone to help describe your way through an airport or something. So yeah, I think that the, and be, and because it's been delivered often through the third sector through the charitable sector and the, those organizations. I think Francois described the, the many relationships they have with all the different disability associations. You know, that's that seemed to be that charitable element. And what we've got to do is get, move away from that and make sure we see it as being part of the mainstream, supporting everyone in society. And the thing I was going to mention on the previous comment was, uh, Neil, your, your Perry um, issue, that of course we're also seeing that in the way interfaces are designed. And I know personally, I prefer accessing things through my iPhone now with voiceover because there's less, uh, dare I say, it, guff on the screen, less clutter on the screen. Now, clutter is the wrong word, but you know, there's just less mess on the screen. And, and therefore, it's easier from an accessibility point of view. So that simplification of the design interface is absolutely vital. And I think, and, and to your point, Neil, you're screening out so much of the, the irrelevant information, the extraneous information uh, to make things work for you. Now, Dario, we have perhaps time for one very quick last question. Well, in that case, uh, there are so many that I wanted to pick back from the existing, but uh, Sophie Ligo um, mentioned testing in the sense of should telecom service, telecom companies and tech firms need to be accepted, tested by people with live disability. You could also extend it who should be testing, device manufacturers, application developers, and so on. That's forth. lots. Yeah, a really good point. And I don't know if, if Robin's still on joining us, but certainly um, from my point, what, what I found fascinating in some of the preparation for the report, I was talking to some applications companies and they said to me, well, that accessibility is built into those mobile devices. We shouldn't need to worry about it, which was fascinating for me to hear that because, you know, so they were aware of it, but they weren't then thinking about how do they make sure that their applications work properly. And the, and the issue, which I think this refers to, uh, it goes back to Larry's three comments of shift left, you know, born accessible and no regression. One of my pet hates, and another, uh, Chris Mayers, a, a fellow blind person who's done a lot of tech work in his life, um, he's definitely a glass is half empty because he gets so frustrated, especially when people refresh applications and then it's not as accessible anymore. So it's almost, you know, give, giving accessibility is within your grasp and you get a great experience. And then because of a, a technology refresh, or perhaps we're even moving an application to the cloud and moving on to a different platform, suddenly it's not as accessible. So yes, they're, they're testing, I, I think, is absolutely critical. I know in terms of the, I don't know whether, Christopher, you want to comment from a Google point of view on the, on the Android front? I, I think there are, we have the expectation that the operating system and the platform itself should be accessible. That, that sort of table sticks. The, the, the really interesting thing is what can you do on top of that to make things a delight to use? Things like live caption that we created with, with Android allows you to consume other people's content, even if it's not made accessible. Live, trans, live transcribe makes the real world more accessible using our platform. I think the really interesting thing we have to look at the, the, the Microsofts, the Apples, and the Googles, it's the platform's manufacturer's responsibility to make it possible for everything to be made accessible. And then it's up to us and the third-party application developers to make something that's delightful. And that's what makes these things really a pleasure to use. 
and, and I think it's also fair to say when you talk to apps developers and you talk to them about the, you know, like you say, the delight it brings when these things are totally accessible, you know, exposing new information sources, you know, not just Twitter, but what, many, many, many other sources, uh, describing video, you know, that whole notion of describing content to people or interpreting it, like you say, from a deaf person across different, different services, absolutely fascinating. And Chris, that, this is Crosby. I think one thing that, I mean, all of this technology is so amazing and so fascinating. And, you know, I think Hector uh, made a statement earlier, it's about the niche moving to the mainstream. But a part of Neil brought up the point earlier that we can't forget the data that we need and the data that is outdated to drive all of this, the consumer base, the global population that's here, the disposable income numbers are woefully outdated. And so we need those, um, those pieces to come alongside this. So business has an easier conversation about why this is niche to mainstream. That's true. Very good point. A very, very good point, Dean Crosby. Uh, Dario, I think we're, we're approaching the time when you and I need to wrap this up and, and, and put some summary on the table and let everyone go back to their day jobs uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and carry on the good, uh, the good work. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you to, to Christopher. Thank you, Crosby. Thank you, Gio, both for your contribution and, of course, for the captioning. Uh, and, of course, to, to Larry and, and Francois René. And of course, Serena, who couldn't be with us. So, so Dario, should we should we put this to bed? How, what, how would you like to, to to wrap it all up? Well, I think given the level of energy so far from your speakers, the many questions, um, at least I counted fourteen. There you were. Um, maybe we should keep until midnight local time. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's actually this. This is was our first uh, attempt to come here, and I would say for for math was great to listen to learn so much. Uh, I hope our members will take away uh, so much, and we already got some fa fabulous feedback from some some of our members. Uh, it might be that we will have a follow on later. So, uh, please, to all of our speakers, uh, you know, we, we'll come back. We'll ask you for more as well. That's the first thing. And, I'd like to and, say. and I think I think some of the takeaways that, that we we touched upon, which are really important, you know, and and obviously with the statistics that Crosby just just touched upon, we we need clear cleaner and clearer information across all of, all of the areas. I think the other thing, and it's this is around innovation, and Mike Short touched upon it, is that you know actually getting getting people with the different disabilities involved in designing. You know, we're moving into an era now where designing applications, designing services, is because being software centric, we can get people much more involved. You know, listening to the people within your own organization, you know, who might be consumers of the service. I think Francois made that point within Orange about how many the percentage of people he has within the employee base and how they listen to those people. Because, you know, we, we know that, you know, Robin and I would say people with a vision impairment are probably the best to describe the way services should be evolved. You know, and I think the same Neil would, would, would be in agreement from the point of view of people with, with other disabilities. So I think that that issue of of making sure that we get everyone involved in designing and delivering. But I think the most important thing is about educating. And that's certainly the work the Valuable 500 has done about getting CXOs involved in this. And therefore that filter can come down from the very top. But more importantly, I think the, the we talk about the, the digitally impoverished or digital poverty. I think that we have to find this framework within which we can identify how accessibility and people with the different disabilities can get access to the right education. I, I'm, I'm confident for the future because people coming through the education system now, whether if they if they already have a disability, they're already learning with a lot of the assistive technology. So people going through schools with iPads and tablets and the like, do, doing fantastic work. But I think for when, when people, if we want to, say, I think the right word is acquire a disability uh, later in life. Or when people aging people get a disability you know one of the most often asked questions i get is how can i get my parents my elderly parents to listen to audiobooks because they they used to love reading the newspaper or listen or, or reading books so i think that education piece is absolutely down to that touch point we be, because of the industry we're in we've touched upon a lot of the technology all the way from the smartphone to the the brainwave interpretation that neil just introduced you know, we, we, we really need to be pragmatic about it. I think it was uh, Francois René from Orange mentioned this about you know, putting hum the ethnographic humanity, but observing the practical lives of people. And that's at home and in the workplace, but all of these things uh, and, and to all the points that have been made throughout. I think some fantastic comments. I, 
you know, having having chaired it, it's impossible to have captured it all from my side. Yeah. I know MEF will uh, will do a great job of capturing it, uh, and I think Daria, we're going to put this up as a uh, so people can go back and watch it at their leisure to capture the uh, all those funny funny remarks and comments and jokes that we all we all popped in there. But I'd like to say for a big thanks. First of all, to all of the speakers who've contributed either live or on video today. Uh, thank you to Susan and Dario for doing a great job uh, pulling it together. And Dario, I will leave the last word to you. Well, thank you. So again, uh, I'll start thanking you all again. And uh, um, our sponsor with being uh, SyncWord um, uh, to make it uh, accessible today. Um, but I should also say, first of all, some, some of the housekeepings, so much uh, good things will not go to waste. We have, in case you missed or joined later, a full recording available, will be available on our website, but also the reports and the many things we've collected for half a day, we'll have a repository in there. So, but if you want some of the reports, some of the things that have been mentioned today, you will find it there and don't worry, we will send you an email. So you'll have a nice reminder in your inbox. I'm sure you will find it somewhere. Uh, make sure you, you, you're attuned to our math emails in there. Now, and, and that's probably some of the housekeeping, just to say the thank you, and these will continue later. I should also probably uh, apologize. I pushed and pushed this billion because I believe that you need to be counted to count sometimes. And in the market, to know that, and I heard it from Crosby, the 13, 14% pretty match ups with that billion number there. So there are lots of people with disabilities. And, and Chris was saying, and it's a grayscale. You know, it, it is a bit of a, you know, increasing and decreasing number with your abilities itself. Um, however, we, we probably gener um, make some generic statements. Somebody, I think Kim was saying there is something to do in the developing world, and that's definitely true. And there are differences between the, the different markets and probably the different the, the, D, the B2C, the B2B, the G2C, etc. All the different markets and segments you can think of, we should all apply. So we probably uh, try to go for the big number right now, but later on it would be nice to see if we can understand for you as well, a bit more of these differences and specific on what can be done in different areas. I'm also into the camps of the glass full. You decide how much it is, uh, maybe 60, 50, but it, it is a lot of positive things seems to be happening out there. So we will not give up our interest easier to stay, it seems. Um, that's the last word for me, really. And uh, thanks again. I'm sure we'll go back and talk with you all soon. Thank you, Dario. Thanks, everybody. Take care.